Welcome, people. <clears throat> okay, so whenever you do philosophy, I think, or not even philosophy, anything, whenever you state your opinion, there's always going to be people that like to do criticism. Now, this isn't just because criticism is easier to do, which it is, but I feel it's because of the fact that criticism is actually more fun to do for a lot of people. Think about it specifically, my last two videos, I was doing criticism of uh, Stefan Molyneux, right? And I found that a lot more fun than actually sitting there and coming up with my own ideas. But here's the thing, you know, I wasn't, I, I, like, I was sitting there and I was just analyzing his ideas and I was just trying to poke holes in them. I wasn't trying to create, right? Now, of course, that's not entirely true because you obviously bring a part of yourself whenever you do a criticism, right? Because those are your views and your opinions that counter his views and his opinions, or the other person's views and their opinions, right? But that's not the point. The point is your, your consciousness is devoted to looking at his views rather than offering up your own. Now, I mentioned in the last video, my other model videos, that I'm a consequentialist, but I didn't actually explain what my entire morality is. And that's basically what this video is about. Uh, now, to, to elaborate a little bit more on where I'm coming from, it's a lot easier to, to uh, do what I did in the other videos, I think. It's a lot more fun. People are attracted to that thing more. It's kind of like when you're playing a video game, or an RTS, for instance, like Dota 2. It's a lot easier to sit there and comment on what, an, on what the player is doing and point out what they're doing wrong than it is to actually sit there and do the thing yourself. And namely, I feel like with YouTube, people are attracted to criticism more because it's sort of a thing where they just sit down, relax, and watch as somebody pokes holes into something else rather than actually try and do the poking yourself or rather than try and actually build something rather than tear something down. It's easier to tear down than it is to create. And this is a problem, I feel like. If you're going to do philosophy, if you're going to criticize, then at some point you have to say, you have to sit there and decide and, and say, what you actually think, what you actually believe, and not just criticize all the time. You owe it to the person you're criticizing to tell them where you're coming from. At least, that's what I think. Okay? I don't think the way, I don't know, Nietzsche did, where basically all he did was he wrote all these essays and where he just criticized other people and said, you know, philosophers, they'll come in and they think they have everything figured out, right? But at what point will you actually not do that and come out and, instead of just shitting on others, try and build up your own sort of framework, okay? So that's what I'm going to do here, specifically for morality, because in the other videos with Stefan Molyneux, I criticize the deontological morality, I criticize Steph's morality. I want to talk about my morality. And, like I said, I mentioned I'm a consequentialist, and to, to talk about the morality, well, I had to come into the other room because I needed the whiteboard here, and uh, I apologize in advance for the lighting. It's the best I can do on this uh, low budget, but I needed the whiteboard because this is going to get a little mathematical, let's just say. And I'm really, really high on coffee right now, and I just came up with this idea to do the video today because I thought, mm, you know, I should probably uh, d uh, explain to people what my morality is. But I need to do it with, with uh, math, because it, it, it makes a bit more sense. Now, it's not going to be difficult, it's, it's pretty simple stuff. Just bear with me. Essentially, what I, the way I think about it is it all comes down to uh, this equation. M, the, the morality equation, as in the title, M plus A plus C equals X. Now, X, right there, is the moral value. That's what we call the moral value of a particular action, okay? Speaking of coffee, by the way, I'm going to do that a lot. I'm sorry. Hopefully Tim Hortons doesn't uh, shut me down because I'm drinking their stuff. Oh, and by the way, Tim Hortons coffee, great. Okay, don't shut me down. No copyright stuff, please. Anyway, X. X is the moral value. Ignore this stuff right here. X is the moral value of a particular action. It's a mathematical value. It's, it's, it's a real number, let's say. If you don't know what a real number is, then just forget what I said, it's just a number. It's a, it could be an integer or a, or, a, or a decimal or anything, any number. It's finite. That's what it is. It's a bit of moral action. Uh, to calculate what it is, okay, the basic principle of morality is we, 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 um, we look at two different actions in any given circumstance, and we compare the values of x. 
the x for one action will be x1, the x for another action will be x2. We compare them, we do which one is higher. Now in any given circumstance, there's basically an infinite number of these. So you have to judge the x's based on your best ability. And that's not going to satisfy a lot of people, I guess, but that's pretty much the limit. That, that is a limit of morality that exists because there's a limit to human cognition. There's no way of escaping that, right? Now let's talk about these things. Uh, M and A and C. This is why I call it the, uh, the Mac equation. There might be a better name for it that we come up uh, later, but this is the, the coolest thing I could come up with for the time being. I'm sorry if it doesn't please you. The M stands for motivation or intention. The A stands for action, and the C stands for consequence. Now I mentioned I'm a consequentialist, right? Basically what you do is you take any decision and you have to look at three things. You have to look at the intention of the individual or the people or your intention, let's say, specifically, because this is all going to be relative to the person making the decision. Your motivation. And this has a positive or negative value. Again, these three values can take any, can take any value, positive or negative, on the real number line. The action section, this uh, is harder to explain. This is the intrinsic intrinsic moral value of a particular action. I'll explain what that is a little bit later, and this is the moral value of a consequence. Now, the way these are calculated, well, okay, I'll get into how they're calculated a bit later, and at the end of the day, this is all gonna get kind of subjective, but, you know, just bear with me. I'm just, I'm not trying to, I'm just sort of trying to explain. Yeah, that's what the purpose of this is. Let's talk about the motivation, okay. Why is the motivation even there? Now, I mentioned in the last video, well, okay, just think about it intuitively. Let's say that someone does something to you that you don't like. Now, let's say they lie to you. You don't like that. But let's say they lie to protect you. Okay, what if they lie to hurt you? Now, there's a difference between those two, right? If they lie to protect you, that's bad. If they lied to hurt you, Sorry, if they lie to hurt you, uh, that's, that's really bad because they're trying to hurt you and they might try to hurt you again later. If they lie to protect you, you know they're on your side even though they did something bad so you still have faith in them in the future. That's why I think this needs to be there. The intrinsic action section, well, okay. Yeah, the intrinsic action section is pretty obvious because all deontological ethics that exists is pretty much based entirely on this. It's just this middle value taken, that's it. Uh, m like, murder is worse than theft, and theft, or murder is worse than rape, rape is worse than theft, theft is worse than lying, and uh, other than that, I don't know what it is. You just look at, you, there's an arbitrary numerical value assigned to a given action, and the one that has the worst action is at the bottom. Now, this is positive if the action is good, intrinsically good, and it's negative if it's intrinsically bad. Now, I would say murder is intrinsically bad, and I think most of us can probably agree to that. So yes, murder would have a very large negative value. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. I can't, you, you, at no point in this do I give actual numbers for any of these values, because you can't do that. I mean, it's not that simple. I mean, to do that, the, the, the numbers exist in our brain as like electrons and information, but I can't actually write them down. Uh, there's just sort of an intuitive idea of, of how big the numbers are, in my mind at least. You can't, because anytime you, you try to actually give numbers to this, you're going to run into problems, I swear, because you're going to run into numbers that don't add up. It's better to just forget the numbers part of it, but just understand, understand that you're going to be adding stuff and then understand that you're going to be comparing stuff. Like, I don't know if, intrinsically, right here, if murder is five times as bad as theft, or six times as bad as theft. All I know is that intrinsically it is worse than theft by a decent amount. And that's all I have to know, I feel like. Now C is the consequences, and one way to think about A is A is basically the immediate consequence of the action. Like if I murder you, you are no longer alive, and that is intrinsically bad. A consequence is something that comes after that immediate uh, con this, the C, includes consequences that come after the immediate consequence. Specifically, if I murder you and you are no longer alive, then there's a funeral and your family is sad because you are no longer alive. That would be uh, a non-immediate consequence. That's other stuff. Oh, now there's one more important point before we get into the nitty-gritty. There's actually a fourth value here that I'm going to write 
and I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to call it U. I'm going to call it U. This fell down. Whoops. Right. I'm going to call it U. Why am I calling it U? Because U represents the unforeseeable consequences to what you do. Now, the immediate critique to this is my people think, okay, well, you can't just look at consequences because there's always going to be consequences you can't foresee. Like, and thanks to chaos theory and the butterfly effect, there really will be consequences you can't foresee. Maybe something I do today causes an avalanche that kills a million people uh, a thousand years in the future, right? Maybe. Maybe it does. There's always going to be stuff like that. The reason this is here is mathematically it has to be there because we know it's there. The reason we don't write it and the reason I don't even consider it is because I, it doesn't matter. You, by definition, is the unforeseeable consequences, meaning you cannot predict them. If you can't predict the consequence, there's no point in trying to make a moral decision based on the consequence because it's not something you know. It's not something you can ever know, by definition. The most we can do is try and expand our knowledge and our understanding of the universe uh, so that this value becomes as small as possible. But it's always going to be there. There's no way of escaping it. Even, like, we can't be infinitely intelligent, right? And we can't infinitely predict what's going to happen in the universe, especially with quantum mechanics and stuff. So this value is always going to be here, and it's always going to be, well, I mean, it could be positive or negative. It's always going to be uncertain, okay? And, yeah, because of chaos theory and determinism and all the stuff I mentioned. Now, I want to mention... Okay, if you don't know what chaos theory is, that doesn't matter. It, the point is, is that anything you do now will cause... It will affect stuff in the future to an insane degree that you can never know. Just accept that. If you don't accept that, well, that's another debate. But yeah, the point is this here. Now, one justification for motivation, if you're not convinced with me, because some of you smart asses might think like, okay, okay, it doesn't matter what your motivation is if you punch me in the face, because at the end of the day, you just punched me in the face. True, but think about it like this. If I punched you in the face, so that the blow would avoid, would, would move your head back and, and um, prevent you from getting hit in the face with an arrow, for instance, then clearly I had your best interest in heart. Whereas if I punched you in the face because I wanted to hurt you, then what that means is, in the consequence section, I still want to hurt you, right? That motivation doesn't necessarily change. The point is, if you don't include this value, if you don't think about motivations at all, there will be unforeseeable consequences that will be bad. Point, the, the, the point of having consequences at all is to try and eliminate the bad consequences, to try and increase the moral value as much as possible. And we can only increase the moral value if we have certainty as to what's going to happen. And not including M gives us uncertainty here. It makes U bigger. We don't want you to be big. We want you to be small, because if you is small, we have more certainty and we can make better decisions. And knowing the motivation of an individual helps us make better decisions, because if an individual, if we know that they are cruel, if we know that they are evil, if we know that they're a sociopath and they're motivated to do bad stuff, well then obviously, obviously we have a better idea of what's here, and U is going to be smaller, and X is going to be bigger by virtue of that. That's my justification for M, but yeah. That's the basic principle is there. Now, I think that this, this part here is pretty, pretty simple. You know, we can all agree that M, A, and C belong in this equation. And why I disagree with deontological ethics so much, and Kantian ethics, and Stefan Molyneux's ethics, is because all they look at is A. All they look at is A. They don't look at M, they don't look at C, but naturally, though, M and C do matter. M and C make us make better decisions. Making a decision based on A, you're not using all the information at your disposal. You're, you're either ignoring, you either don't have other information or you're just ignoring it. And ignoring information that you have that's plain there to see is just stupid. And that's the, that's the type of morality where, that I think people get a little biased and a little crazy and a little dogmatic even, is that they try to defend some arbitrary principle in A rather than looking at M and C. Now, before going down to the nitty-gritty of M, A, and C, there's one thing I forgot to mention, I think. And forgive me if I forgot to mention, because I'm really high... Mm. 
and a little disoriented, right? Right, okay. So the point of A, again, is those immediate consequences. And the truth of it is, I've explained... So the way that I've gone about this is a little backwards, because I've told you that there's these three numbers that we need to add together. They could be positive or negative, and if the result is negative, then that's bad. If the result is positive, that's good. Or basically, we take the result that's the most positive that we can get. You know, we, we, we try and maximize x. That's, that's the goal of morality. But I haven't actually talked about how these values, uh, what, what they are, and whether they're positive or negative, or, not, or how positive and negative they are. The answer to that is not simple, and at the end of the day, it's going to be very, very arbitrary as to what the values of uh, M, A, and C are. More specifically, A and C. I think with M, we all sort of agree and have an intuitive idea that the more selfish you are, the more uh, evil you are, the more negative this is, and the less negative it is, the more selfless you are. Right? <sighs> of course. Now, specifically, the issue comes into play when we look at A. A is intrinsic, intrinsic moral value of an action. What is the moral value of murder? What is the moral value of theft? What is the moral value of rape? What is the moral value of writing a scientific paper? Okay, the, the, this, it's not complicated, but the basic principle I'm saying is that we need to list all possible actions, all possible actions here, and we give each of them an intrinsic moral value, and then we compare them when we evaluate A. And then when we look at C, what we're trying to figure out, what we're, what we're trying to figure out is what actions in A are caused in C, right? What actions in A get caused by the universe if we allow it to go forward? If we allow it to go forward once we do a certain action. Now, um, this is a little unintuitive, given that I don't believe in free will, but the very fact that you're making a choice here sounds like I do, but I actually don't, and the fact that the consequence section... just... okay. I'm gonna say right here, the fact that you have a choice of A, and the fact that C is... the, the, the value of C obviously depends on causality, right? The value of A is a choice, okay, but C doesn't take into account choices. Well, it does, but those choices are still... okay, just... I might even confuse myself here, but just trust me that this formula does not contradict determinism. It does not contradict... it does not, like... The free will is not implied by this, or I don't assume free will when I make this choice. I don't believe in free will uh, as a compatibilist. At best, I'm a compatibilist, and like 60% of philosophers are compatibilists, so there's merit to that idea, but that's not even the point. The point is... Trust me, okay, trust me, uh, free will and determinism do not clash with this formula at all. And if you don't believe me, uh, that's also another debate that I don't really want to talk about now because we'd be here for hours. Anyway, the point is, with C, you try and figure out what people will do and what uh, actions will be taken in the future. And with A, you try to figure out what is intrinsically good or bad. And if something is intrinsically bad, then the value of this is negative. But if it causes intrinsically good things to happen in the future, based on choices that other people make, that you know they will or will not make, then X can be positive, right? Right, that's the point. That's the whole point of consequentialism, is that we can, we can make sacrifices and do bad things here if C is very high. Now, there's a way to do it that's very important. I'm a consequentialist, but I'm not just any consequentialist. I'm not a utilitarian in the classic John Stuart Mill sense, right? So, C, not all consequences outweigh, uh, outweigh stuff like murder, okay? Like, what if, you know, like, it's say, okay, what if you murder someone in A, but then the consequence is that a lot of people get really rich, right? Then isn't that good? Isn't X really positive? No, because the fact that this is negative means that this is, X is not as high as it could be than if A were positive. See, the fact is, reality is so complex that we can probably yield higher values of X if we make A positive and don't murder. I'm just saying, like, the, the idea, the, the, the argument against murder here is that there's always a way to, to, to do something around murder and not actually have to murder. You know, there's, um, there's going to be an alternative solution or an alternative path that will give us a better consequence, right? 
that's the principle. That's why murder is bad. Not that it's just intrinsically bad. Like, murdering one to protect millions is only justified, only, if that is the highest X we can get. If there is a way to save millions without murdering the one, then that is a higher value of X, a much higher value of X. That's why X is higher. That's why we do that. That's why I said right at the start that we do this, we, we look at all possibilities that we can, and we try and make it in such a way that X is as high as it can possibly be. Now, there's a subtlety here that I forgot to mention. And I'm actually not certain about this, but if you murder one person, this is intrinsically evil, but is this value, is A higher if you murder two people? Or is that factor, or is that factored into the consequence? Now, off the top of my head, I would say that murdering two people is intrinsically worse than murdering one. So, yes, this would be more negative, but the consequences would also be even more negative if you murder two people. Well, I mean, they could be positive, it depends, but uh, you see the point. So, A takes into account numbers. It's, it's, it's literally the quantity of bad that is, that is happening right now at this moment within, like, time T0, right? A is literally that value. So, murdering a thousand people is worth the murdering a thousand one. Now, before we move on, to uh, the nitty-gritty, like I said. With most moral situations, most moral decisions, I would argue that applying the formula is very, very easy. I would argue that applying, that figuring out how big A is and how big C is, again, you can't do it with numbers, but you can compare them intuitively. You, I feel like doing that, you will, uh, more often than not, there will be a pretty big difference between two moral decisions that you can make the choice pretty easily. However, there's some not obvious ones. I can come up with not obvious situation, not obvious circumstance where applying this formula is not easy because intuitively we can't actually calculate how big A and C are relative to one another. But situations like this probably won't happen. But okay, here's an example. Um, let's say you have to murder a thousand people. Let's say your choices are murdering a thousand people or a thousand and one people. Now, A is clearly higher with the 1001, or, sorry, lower, more negative, right? Let's say that M is your motivation is 100% one, is uh, good, right? Let's say that you're doing it to protect millions, right? So whatever, you're, you're, you're not trying to hurt people, but you have to. That's the choice. The circumstance has somehow come to be that you have to murder 1,000 or 1,001 people. So this is going to be the same in other case. This is going to be insanely negative, like really, really high, because you're murdering a thousand people. What you have to look at is the consequence. And here's where the system is kind of, um, kind of broken, is because you can't... Because the numbers are so high, the consequences will be pretty... Okay, let's say the consequences will be pretty bad, but you don't know how bad. Um, actually, no, let's say the consequences are going to be good. Right? Let's say the consequences are going to be good in either case. It's not easy to know which one's worse. For instance... Well, okay. Let's say that you have to sacrifice a thousand people... Um, to some demon monster god. And if not, he'll destroy the human race. Well, if you sacrifice a thousand people, then he lets everyone live for a year. And the consequence is uh, high, right? The consequence is going to be very good. But if you kill a thousand and one people, then this, you don't know how well, how much C is going to be affected, okay? You don't know how much killing that extra person is actually going to affect the consequences. Maybe, okay, well, this, this isn't the best example. My point is, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't actually know how much C will be affected by killing that extra person. You have the huge consequence of killing a thousand people has a positive or negative value depending on the situation that you can determine pretty easily. But the one thousand and first person, that's not obvious because the effect of the a thousand people dying overshadows the effect of the one person dying. So the marginal, just adding one person to that sum, you, you, Adding one person to that sum makes you bigger, it does not make C bigger, and you don't know, and by bigger I mean it changes you more than it does C, and the consequence is not foreseeable. That's, so, 
I mean, technically, if the consequence weren't foreseeable, you would just make the decision based on how big A was, and A is definitely bigger if you kill 1,001 people relative to 1,000, but my point is, is that with high numbers, with very, very high numbers, it isn't obvious how, uh, it's not obvious how the consequence gets changed. And because of the fact that U is much bigger, if you don't kill the 1,000 first person, then you might want to kill 1,001 people just to make you small because the consequences are going to be more uncertain if you don't. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, see, it, it, there's, there, there's subtlety to how this actually applies because you can, you can pretty easily come up with scenarios where uh, the, the consequence function, the consequence value, will get all muddled up depending on what you do, and if it is, then you can't make a proper decision because if 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 the absolute value of the consequence value of the consequence number is small, but the absolute value of u is high, then you're you're in trouble. You don't want u to be high, and you'd never know what u is. But just you know that it you know that u grows if you're less certain about what the consequences are, right? By definition, and if you know less about the consequences, you're in trouble. That's just something I wanted to point out. Okay. Now, I want to move on and actually explain to you how do we determine how high A, M, and C are, depending on a given action. Because it's not obvious, and we can't just do this arbitrarily. We have to categorize actions in some way. If it's just arbitrary, then it's, it's, this entire model is too muddied, it's too hairy. It's like I could just come in here and say, well, my motivation for doing good things is infinitely high, and therefore no matter what I do is good. You can't do that. You, you, you just can't do that. You actually have to have a framework for how these three things get calculated. And that's what I call the uh, virtue framework. This is what I call a virtue. A virtue is, um, I'm going to define it here, a virtue is anything that has moral value, any type of action that has moral value, which is a pretty general idea because every action, every human action has a moral value, positive or negative. Uh, but, okay, no, no, a virtue is something that has positive moral value. Okay, well, the, the, the exact definition is worth, but, let, okay, the point of a virtue, no, let's say this, I can define virtue mathematically. Virtue is a function that takes a human behavior, human behavior, converts it to a number that gets added up in this equation to determine x it converts an action to a moral value. That's what a virtue is. A virtue is a function. Now, there's a whole set of these functions, okay? If you don't know what a function is, don't worry. <laughs> there's a whole set of these functions that we use to determine the moral value of a given uh, action, and we add it up to apply the equation. Now, th this V-I-R-T here stands for virtue. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have space to write virtue, so I'm just gonna outline this like this. Actually, you know what? No, I'm gonna just write V. Because that's a lot easier. V, V, V. V. V for Vendetta. Okay, V. God, how well is that even seen? Nah, it's good enough. Okay. So V stands for virtues. Um, yeah, I don't explain. Okay, so we need a virtue. Let's try and come up with virtues. Let's, ha let's have an exercise here. I wanted to brainstorm virtues with you guys, right? So let's try to come up with a virtue that um, whenever you do something, whenever any action that, that gets happened, a virtue, this virtue, let's call it oh, E for instance, this virtue E, it will take that action and convert it to a moral value for M, a moral value for A, and a moral value for C. Not U because we can't calculate U. In fact, I'm going to erase this because it just screws everything up. It just makes everything complicated. Forget about U. Okay, but it gives us a moral value, gives us a value for M, A, and C. By the way, anytime I use, <clears throat> anytime I use the word value, I'm talking about moral value. There's no other kind of value, okay? A, a value in general is a quantity. It means a numerical value that becomes X. Now, a specific kind of value would be a specific kind of value in terms of a virtue, like the E value is the moral value of this virtue E we talked about. Let's actually write it down. Uh, you know what? I wonder if this is... You know what? Yeah, yeah, I'll write E right here. I don't need this V because I've hammered that in, okay? E. 
our moral value, our virtue E, gives us a moral value for our motivation if we're motivated, if we have E in mind and we're motivated by E, then E takes our action and converts that to a moral value for E. The action we take has a value for E, an intrinsic value for E, and there's consequences, a consequential value for E, okay? You add the three up and you get a X value for E, okay? So, the question is, what should E be? What examples of E be? This is pretty much a question of what do we want in an ideal society? What virtues is an ideal society uh, based on? I mentioned in my Stefan Molyneux, my last Stefan Molyneux video, is that we have state A for society, and we have state B, and we want to get to state B from A and stay there. Well, what does state B have, specifically? What virtues does state B have? Do, okay, so yeah, what, what should E be? Now, let's say even this. Let's say E is a primary virtue, like a number one virtue that we have to adhere to more than any other virtue. Does such a virtue exist? Well, let's just imagine that it does. Do you guys have any ideas for a good, for a good idea for what E should be? Nope? Okay, so I'll give you my version of what E is. Now, E is a lot of things technically, but in general I want to call it empathy. Right? E is empathy. Or love, compassion, um, sympathy, understanding, and just basically intimacy, right? That's what, that's what E is. Excuse me. That's what E is in this definition, okay? <clears throat> Why is E the number one virtue? Why do I say that it's the primary virtue? Well, the reason I have, and you know what, I don't even know if this is visible that much. E. So, okay, if E is empathy, that's why I use the word E, the letter E, by the way, then we have E of, uh, E sub M, E sub A, E sub C, and E sub X. Now, I said that E is a function, right? So this function M, it takes the motivation I have whenever I do something, and it calculates how much empathy I have, and it and how much empathy I have is a moral value, intrinsically, which is a number that goes here. This is a function. The E sub A is a function that takes my, um, the, the intrinsic empathy of what I do and gives me a number. E sub C gives the consequential empathy of what I do and gives that a number, and E sub X is the total empathy of what I do, right? So E is a sort of, um, it's, it's, it's a vector valued function. Well, this is just fancy math language, but it's because it has, it takes, it gives me three values, right? It gives me a vector in R3. It, it goes from, well, it goes from the phase space of reality because that's how, it, you know what, ignore that. That's just fancy math talk, but it, it, it goes from phase space of reality and gives me a vector in R3. That's what E is. It's very, very simple. Okay. Now, why is E the primary virtue? And why did I say the primary virtue? Okay, first of all, what is the primary virtue? I say the primary virtue is the virtue that is more important than any other virtue. As in, when we're looking for X, we want to maximize EX more than anything else. Actually, no, not even that. EX gives us... It, it, another, actually, one way to think about it is that EX e, um, increases faster than any of the other functions. Because this is all in terms of moral value, right? That's our unit, moral value. You know, e of M, e, e sub A and E sub C. Actually, E sub X in general, it, it grows a lot faster depending on where we are, depending on what the action is. It can be very, very high or very, very low, right? Like if you murder, E is X is going to be really, really low, like astronomically low, like minus a million moral value. Whereas if you do something very good, like give a poor person a million dollars, I don't know, or save starving kids in Africa, then the positive, then it's going to be very, very high, very high positive value for E. E can go up and down like crazy. That's the point of E. That's what I call the primary virtue. Okay, it's the virtue that changes the most because it has the highest spread of values. And the reason is because if it has the highest spread of values, 
then in intuitively that means it's the virtue that we care about the most, or that we should care about the most. So my argument here, the arbitrary thing I'm saying, is that we should care about empathy and love more than anything. More than anything else, more than any other virtue you guys might think about. Why? Okay. Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but the basic principle I have is that a society with empathy is probably better than a society... A society with empathy that lacks everything else, lacks, I don't know, intelligence or, or whatever, is still better than a society that uh, has intelligence but lacks empathy, or a society that has, I don't know, art but lacks empathy, you know? Societies that lack empathy can be very, very, very cruel and very bad. Societies that have empathy, you know, for, for individuals, for groups, for people, societies that lack empathy are in general very, very uncertain and can have a lot of uh, lack of well-being. Societies with lots of empathy, you know, let's say there's a society that has a lot of empathy, you know, people have a lot of empathy, but they don't have a lot of intelligence. Um, you know, that's possible, right? And people say intelligence is very important, but think about it, you know, even people without intelligence, but with empathy, people will only inadvertently cause pain. You know, you will be very high, but E will not, you, sorry, you is going to be, when I say high, I mean its absolute value is going to be high. It's, it could be very high or very low. There's a lot of uncertainty without intelligence, but with, uh, but there's at least goodwill, and there's at least the attempt at causing good things. Whereas without E, you run into problems. Um, think about it like this, okay? Here's why I don't want to have E in, in my ideal society. Here's why it's not the primary virtue. Is it possible to have intelligent people that lack empathy. Just think about that for a second. Is it possible? Okay, obviously it is. Is it good? Who do you think causes more harm? A stupid person without empathy? Or a smart person without empathy? Now, a stupid person without empathy is basically chaotic evil, right? They're chaotic. And if they have a lot of power, certainly they can cause a lot of harm. But a person with intelligence and empathy, with intelligence and a lack of empathy, with intelligence and malice or selfishness, that's lawful evil. They can potentially cause even more harm if they wanted to. Let's think about it like this. Are sociopaths unintelligent? Are sociopaths intelligent people? Ask yourselves that. Now, if you've met a sociopath that wasn't intelligent, uh, let me tell you, they weren't a sociopath. No, no. The, see, the sociopaths are very intelligent people. They are very manipulative. They are uh, very socially manipulative, emotionally manipulative, not intellectually manipulative. You can't really manipulate a person's brain, you know. If a person doesn't accept something based on logic and fact, then you can't manipulate them into accepting it unless you're really, really smart or really, like, insane, right? But emotional manipulation is something sociopaths do all the time, and since we're all emotional individuals, creatures, that's kind of a problem, right? Sociopaths are social vampires, and that's probably the biggest reason why um, I say empathy is the primary virtue, because without it, the primary virtue, say, being intelligence, can be a society full of sociopaths. And you wouldn't want to live there. You would not. That would not, that, it would not be fun, in the very least. It would be dangerous. Sociopaths are dangerous. Individuals willing to cause harm are dangerous, right? So that's why I say empathy. That's one of the reasons why empathy. Moreover, I just think that it works more. I think that, you know, intelligence isn't... Everybody's intelligent about something. Everybody has some sort of skill. You know, some people might not be book smart, and that's a huge problem in today's society. I agree. But at the end of the day, you know, sacrifice book smarts and at least make them caring people they will still make more or less decent choices if they at least are caring, empathetic people. One flaw with empathy. One flaw with empathy. One this, okay? Or obvious flaws. You guys could argue that nobody lives by this virtue, the way I've defined it. That I don't even live by it. Let's, here's an example. Here's a uh, Sam Harris example. Let's say there's like a boulder rolling down a hill and you can divert its path. Now, there's only two paths, and on the one path is 20 innocent people that would die. And on the other path is one person, but that one person is your mother, or father, or lover, so on and so forth. 
You get the idea. How does empathy actually work in this context as a primary virtue? Because you're supposed to have empathy for the 20 people, right? But you have empathy for your mother more. You love your mother more than 20 strangers, so there's a problem there. So the morally correct action to take in today's society, I would say, is to kill the 20 people, unfortunately, because, um, well, your mother isn't worth it. Sorry, they're not worth your mother. Or at least... Uh, that sounds cruel, but think about the fact that a lot of us would probably choose to kill the 20 rather than kill our own parents, and so on. Uh, so that's the obvious flaw with this. The obvious flaw is this is actually harder to implement than, than anything, any other possible, than intelligence, for instance, as a virtue. This is very hard to implement. And basically, what this means, what this empathy thing means, is it means you're supposed to look at those 20 strangers, not as strangers, but as your mother as well. Like, each individual within the 20 is as intimate and important to you as your own mother is. Understand? It's like, and it's not like you don't know them, it's not like they're strangers. Like, what I'm saying, again, we're talking about this uh, B state of society where everything is perfect. In that society, you know these 20 people, they're not just strangers. You know them, and you're as intimate with them as you are with your own mother. You trust them as much, they trust you as much, you care about them, they care about you, you guys will support each other, they're not just your friends either. That's kind of what I mean with empathy, okay? We need to construct a society where every single person is as intimate to every other person as a family is, right? That's kind of another reason why empathy is such a brilliant virtue. What's the, um, what, what, what sort of support structure does an individual have in today's society? Their family, right? Like, if you don't have a family, you're screwed, pretty much. If you, if you have a loving family, then you are raised well, you are given resources, you are uh, trained to, to, to prepare yourself for the world, and if the world punches you, if the world hurts you, you can always go to your family for support and emotional support, right? Which is very, very important. Family is incredibly important because family is pretty much unconditional empathy. And I mentioned uh, in my Stefan Molyneux video how all rights are conditional. The right to empathy is not conditional. The right to empathy is universal. The empathy is always, 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 always good. That's basically what I'm suggesting is this, this B state of society, this paradise, the entire planet, all seven, eight billion of us, is one giant family. Everybody knows each other. Everybody loves each other. Now, of course, you might be saying is that that's way too idealistic, right? It's, of course it is. It is idealistic. It's not possible in today. Because, literally, I do not have the time or the resources to communicate with all 8 billion people on the planet, right? I don't have that luxury. But I should. And understand, scientifically, it is possible for me to have that type of connection with people. It requires a brain enhancement, a, a like... I basically need to be a cyborg in a brain enhancement. I need to constantly have my brain linked to every other human being on the planet. I need to be a lot smarter to have the processing power to deal with all that information, uh, to be able to communicate with all 8 billion people. I need to be pretty much always plugged in to this sort of neural network. That's what needs to happen in order for this virtue to be applied the way I'm suggesting it should. And this is actually something I 100% support. A massive neural network which is something that is possible in the future once uh, uh, neural interfaces are constructed, once brain enhancements become being constructed. This would be hundreds of years in the future, of course, but it is possible when human beings learn to enhance our own brains, there's no limit to this, and there's honestly no limit to how connected we become with other people. That's what the internet is today. It's, it's you becoming connected with other people on a superficial level more often than not, but that's just because we can't communicate with one another on a subconscious, intimate level yet. So the most intimacy we could have is with our families and a small group of friends. And honestly, if you ask me, I try to, I always try to, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of an extrovert. I try to be as intimate with other people as possible when I'm around them. Uh, but there's always going to be a limit to how much I can do right now. To do it perfectly, which is what this model requires, you need to have... Uh, you need to have neural interfaces. You need the human brain needs to be much more advanced than the way it currently is, which I believe is scientifically possible in the future. And if you don't think that's scientifically possible, or you don't even understand what I'm talking about, neural interfaces, what cyborgs, what? No, just don't worry about it. Just, just trust me. Uh, thinking about all eight billion people on the planet as your family is possible. It's just not possible yet, and we'll leave it at that. 
So that's how this virtuoso works. So in that case with the boulder, basically all 20 people are like other family members to you, that you care about and I care about you just as much as you care about your own mother, so in that case you definitely would uh, kill the, the one over the 20 because on an intimate emotional empathy level, the one and the 20 are the same. Now, th th this is how this thing applies in a perfect world. In a non-perfect world, in today's world, where we don't actually have connections with everyone on the planet, the best we can do is apply empathy as much as we can, which is to try and understand and empathize with people who live in third world countries and who we don't know as much as we can, which is hard to do because we don't know them and we're not connected and we don't feel their pain. Hell, we don't even feel the pain of the people around us. I mean, my parents feel pain and I sometimes don't feel the pain that they do. My, my friends feel pain and I sometimes don't get it. Uh, there's always going to be that little gap. Hell, even when neural interfaces and, like, uh, thought links, we'll, we're still going to have that gap. But the point isn't, uh, the, the goal overall is to conquer the gap. What we can do now is to try and, uh, try and empathize as much as we can, try and minimize that gap as much as we can, right? That's sort of the idea, and that's what I try to do whenever I make my moral decisions, is I try to... Well, I don't always think about E because I'm not always good at understanding that other people have a, a need. So, th that's actually another virtue that I'm going to get to. It's called being aware. But I have the empathy... I would say that I have that empathy, or not, not the, the crazy level of empathy that, that involves uh, loving everyone equally. But an amount that understands the virtue of that, uh, th that type of thinking, and I, I would say that, honestly, I would say that I try to empathize with people as much as I can when it really comes down to it. You know, sometimes I get a little angry, but then eventually I will sit down and I will think and I will try and empathize. And it's very important to do that whenever you make a moral decision to see if it's good or not. So this is the primary virtue. Now let me take a swig here, in just a second. Mm. This ice cap is water, at this point, and sugar. And I like it very much. Mm. So are there other virtues, I guess is the question, right? What other virtues are there? Because I've been talking about empathy as a primary virtue. Oh, one reason I forgot to mention why this is the primary virtue is because a society that applies empathy the way I said it does, in the perfect way, even if people are incredibly stupid, even if people suck, right? even if they can't apply empathy well because they don't understand one another, but if they're willing to, it's going to be a pretty good society if you think about it. It's, it's something I'd much rather live in than what we have today. Well, not necessarily, but uh, it might not be a very scientifically advanced society, but it's, it's sort of... People are always willing to do good in a society like this. So, essentially, people are always willing to help one another. So even if you're a sociopath or somebody selfish, then in this society that applies E perfectly, you still get what you want, because what's good for everybody will automatically be good for you. Okay, because think about families again. Families aren't fighting one another ever, so they're always sort of, they're not competing. They're always moving together along a straight path through life. Well, not along a straight path, you know, the path might go in a separate directions, but they all support one another's path. So, they get further, okay? People with real good families get a lot further than people that have terrible families. I'm just going to be honest, and that's the unfortunate truth of it. You know, people think in, in um, you know, in classic American capitalism that competition is what yields progress, and that is true in a practical sense, but in a philosophical sense, it's wrong, because if you think about it, it's not the competition itself that's creating the progress, it's the fact that a company has all of these people in it that all work towards one goal, okay? The motivation for that goal comes from the fact that there's another company that's a rival, but the actual action is that these people are all working together. And that's what empathy is. It's when we all work together, which overall is more efficient and better for everyone. It, it, it gets us to go even further. It's like the entire planet is one big company. Think about what can be made. The only, uh, the only difference is that in we, competition motivates uh, progress today's society because of selfishness. If empathy, motiv well, if empathy motivated progress, for instance, then we wouldn't need competition to create progress. We would actually be one unified, we, we, we would be one unit 
that tries to move towards progress. And we do it a lot better, we do it a lot faster, we'd be a lot better at it because we're never, we don't lose energy or efficiency fighting one another, right? So that's the, the so in a, in a long-term sense, this benefits selfish people as well. Even selfish people that don't have empathy should at least pretend that they do because it's this idea that good for everyone is best, for, is more good for you. Like the amount of good in the long run that you attain for yourself by being selfish is less, the amount of EX for you is less than the amount of EX, you, the amount of, um, sorry, the amount of X, the amount of moral good, the amount of, so, I'm getting confused, okay. The amount of, the amount that you can, the amount of utility you can get for yourself in the long run by being selfish is less than the amount of utility you get for yourself in the long run by being selfless. Because in the long run by being selfless, if everybody were selfless, if everybody uh, applied this, if everybody were selfless in the long run, then more would be produced overall, and so the individual would, e would get more e in the long run, in the long run rather, than the amount that they would get if they uh, were in competition with everybody else. More for everybody is more for you. In economics and practice, this is a little more complicated, but I'm just trying to stress the point that more for everybody is more for you in the long run. Not the short run. Not the short run. Like, within your lifetime, you could probably make a ton of money by being selfish and being a sociopath, but in the long run, like, if you live for thousands of years, you would definitely gain more in, in huge, over huge periods of time if you, if you went if you have, uh, worked with the flock, is what I'm saying. So that's how I justify E. Now what other virtues are there? What, uh... What other virtues are there? Can you guys think about, okay? I already mentioned one virtue, which was, uh, intelligence. I'm trying to, hold on, hold on a sec, I'm trying to figure out if the lighting is actually blocking this, uh, from seeing what's over here. Let's see if I could turn you off. Does that make it better? No, it doesn't. The window is just... You know what? Sorry, I'm just gonna have to uh, erase this and make it bolder. There we go. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's the best I can do. My lighting situation is so low budget right now, I can't make this perfect, but... Okay, what other virtues are there? What other virtues... Wait, hold on, is that camera time going off? Nope, it's not, okay. What other virtues are there? I mentioned one, that's intelligence. More specific, I'll call that I. I, I am, I, A, that, you know what, this is way too big. I, E, and I, C, and I, X. You know what, I might run out of room here. I'm gonna put columns, eh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I. Intelligence, right? Because obviously to apply empathy properly, you need, okay, so I just wanted to say, this is the primary virtue here. Primary, first. Intelligence is what I would call a secondary virtue. It's incredibly important, but the primary virtue supersedes it. The reason is, uh, again, I already covered why primary virtue, why E is a primary virtue, but why is intelligence a secondary virtue? Because it's incredibly important. Okay, there's going to be a tertiary virtue as well, tertiary virtues, which I'll get to later. I might actually have to pause this video and go uh, and dump the footage and then do it again. Anyway, psh, sorry. Why is intelligence so important? Because you need intelligence to figure out what C is, right? Remember I mentioned unforeseeable consequences? Well, you need intelligence to foresee consequences. You need intelligence to apply the formula. You need intelligence to understand this video. You need intelligence to do philosophy. You need intelligence for everything. Your intelligence is literally a building block for all thought. Okay, so not having it, or, uh, and I mean intelligence in the broadest possible sense, not having an intelligence of any kind is you're basically useless. You can't contribute even if you wanted to because you're not good at it. This is why intelligence is a secondary virtue. It's why it's incredibly important. Again, it's not a primary because a world built on intelligence is most certainly... It, it, it's too uncertain. A society built entirely on intelligence can easily be worse than a society built entirely on empathy. A society built entirely on empathy, it has a minimum value. It has a minimum value that is positive, I would say. A society built on intelligence 
it can either be really high or really low, and probably really, really low, because of all the sociopaths and stuff. So that's intelligence. Now there's one more secondary virtue, which is kind of different from intelligence, but I call it, um, it's sort of more of a category that includes the following. Honesty, truth, and, um, the will to progress society uh, and ensure people to, to, to ensure people's survival and to, to progress science and engineering and technology to ensure people's survival and well-being, basically. It's scientific progress for the sake of uh, the, it's scientific progress uh, to, for the sake of ensuring E for all people, for ensuring well-being. That's, it's scientific progress for well-being's sake, right? Now, I'm actually kind of shocked by the amount of people that don't have E as a primary virtue in real life. You know, you will go outside and basically pick a person at random. Uh, empathy is not the primary virtue for them. Something, there is something they care about a lot more than empathy. On YouTube, I find that a lot of people care about intelligence. A lot of people think that intelligence is the bane of everything. I've already pointed out how it's not, but there's a lot of people that think that. Amazing Atheist thinks that, you know, uh, the whole, like, the, 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 whole Christ, the, the whole atheist community probably thinks that intelligence is the most important virtue. I think the whole atheist community on YouTube is, are basically assholes. No offense, but I don't, I don't like the atheist community on, on YouTube, to say the least. But the truth and honest, you know what, I'm going to say this, um, I'm going to call it T. And then there's T-M, T-A, T-C. And TX. You know what? Don't, don't, wow, my T's are horrible. Don't worry if you can't read this stuff, just listen to what I'm saying and you're gonna understand, I promise. Alright, so TA, TM, TATC, right. So this is truth, honesty, and uh, scientific progress. So scientific progress for ensuring well being is obvious. You know, it's, 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 I mean, you can say that that's kind of depends on intelligence, and it does. But intelligence is sort of a different thing. Like, you can still be willing to do science and not be intelligent. Okay, you can be willing to learn and not be intelligent. Uh, intelligence is literally a capacity to do things type of thing. It's, it's, it's how you train your... Well, I, I meant it in the most broadest sense, but it's a, a training your mind type of thing. It's, it's a being critical type of thing. It's a uh, analytical type of thing that, that, that needs to happen. Uh, doing science for the sake of well-being is obviously needs to be here. Okay, by the way, these two are the secondary virtues. Second. And down here, there's going to be the tertiary virtues. Third. So, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Just fine. Alright, I'm going to cover this, but whatever. So the secondary virtues, right, are, are these two. You have the truth and honesty. So, okay, honesty... I have to mention something about honesty. Honesty is specifically honesty about this. Honesty about your intentions. I find that honesty about your intentions is incredibly important for communication, which is something you need to do. Uh, you need to be aware of a person's motivation in order to make good choices uh, to maximize X, right? You need to know what a person's motivated by, which is easier to do if they're honest. So, and it's another way, it, it makes it easier to apply empathy because if a person is honest about their feelings and what they think and all that stuff, then you know more about them, you, you know, if they're earnest, you know more about them, you know more about what they're going to do, you know more about how they feel, and if you have empathy and you know more about how they feel, then it's easier for you to take into account what they feel and not get confused and not act selfishly and inadvertently. I can say one thing, one thing that bothers me about a lot of people in today's society is that they are not honest. Honesty is not a virtue in today's society. I would actually say honesty is more important than intelligence, because I run into conflicts all the time with people because they aren't honest with me about what they think and what they, how they feel. You know, there's actually pressure in society to sort of figure out what people think and feel without having them tell you. You sort of have to guess, you sort of have to assume, and being a little autistic, uh, you know, about being a little crazy, I don't, I, I, I have a hard time empathizing with people, not because I lack empathy, but because I don't always see what they're trying to do or how they feel. If they were to explain it to me, I almost always, uh, I almost always sort of, uh, submit, to, you know, to their, uh, to their emotions just because I, I care. I don't want them to be upset, but I actually have to sit there and communicate. And this is why getting angry at people doesn't actually work. Honesty 
you know, getting angry at people is sort of a, a lack of honesty thing as well, because to, if you're getting angry at people, you're not being honest about what you're thinking. You're just yelling, you're getting angry, okay? You know, and it, it bothers me that people sort of have to guess. If people were perfectly honest about how they feel, all of this would be a lot easier to apply. You wouldn't have to worry about uh, people lying to you. You wouldn't have to worry, you wouldn't have to guess as to what they're actually thinking. You know, you can calculate Empathy, you can calculate these values, EM, EA, EC, and EX, easier if there's honesty. Because if there's honesty, a person can, um, you know what they care about. And if you know what they care about, then out of empathy for them, you know how much moral value is given to them based on your action. Because you know how much something means to them. If you know how much something means to them, then you know how much well-being they get, how much more well-being they get with something that you do. That's why honesty is important. Uh, it also means honesty with oneself. People, th like, this entire thing includes, uh, like, self-criticism, criticism of others, honesty towards others about how they actually are in a sense of helping them, like, telling people hard truths, you know, being honest if they have a flaw, as well as if they have a pro, you know, stuff like that. It, honesty can be good and bad to a person's feelings, but it can be, but it's almost always good in terms of consequences. In today's society, consequences, like uh, the consequences of honesty, TC over here, almost always good. And I kind of put that together with truth because truth and honesty are sort of similar things. The truth of what, you know, a person is like and, and uh, what they're good at, what they're bad at, people being honest about stuff like that, being honest about, you know, uh, your flaws, like I said, you know, being honest with yourself and being self-critical. And that's actually one thing I really like about Stefan Molyneux is he really, really, really emphasizes um, self-criticism and sort of self-reflection, which is really, really important because of this, because of this thing right here, because of TC. Well, because of T in general, but it's especially because of TC. Um, yeah, and this is this here implies TM implies that honesty is intrin well sorry TA implies that honesty is intrinsically good as well. So that's honesty. Uh, then there's truth. Now I want to mention here that I used to think like when I was in like uh, early first year university, I was really under the impression I I literally believed that truth was the most important virtue. I mean I had it. I even said that I said this truth is the most important thing. I was in a philosophy class once, and I was writing an essay for a test, and the essay question was like, okay, you have a, um, you, you have, it, it asks you for your opinion, you have like a family member that's dying, and will die in like a month, and you can either be honest with them about it, and then they're miserable and scared, or you can, um, because they, they have no idea that the death was coming at all, they're perfectly healthy, but they're gonna die in a month, or you hide it from them, and then they die peacefully without, uh, being sad, or upset, or scared. Which do you do? And I shit you not, I argued in that whole essay that you tell them because truth is more important than well-being. That's what I said. And I completely disagree with that at this point. I would not do that at all. I would lie. I would lie to them because, honestly, them being uh, well off, them feeling good during that whole period is better than... The, 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 it's better... Them feeling good, the E, the intrinsic value of E there is higher than the negative value for being dishonest. That's what I said. The intrinsic value for being empathetic to them and uh, making them feel good is better than being dis is is higher than the negative value of being dishonest towards them and lying to them about that. That's what a white lie is. It's when you lie to someone even though lying is bad intrinsically, but you lie to them because if they feel good, it could be worth it, okay? And again, in terms of you know, in terms of this model I mean, we're going to apply this model to, like, specific examples later. I just want to get a... I just want to explain the virtues first. Yeah, so so that's what I think about truth. It's the same in, like, the whole society. Like, imagine, um... Imagine there's a guy with a gun to your head, and he's, like... He's telling you, you know, tell me the truth or I kill you. But he doesn't know whether what you tell him is truth or not, so you can lie to him and he won't kill you. Do you, you know, lie to save yourself or do you tell the truth? No, you lie, of course, because... Because you living is better than you dying, and the lie is worth it. I'm just saying the lie is worth it in that case. Truth is a pretty big thing, but it's not always a big thing. And usually the cases where you should... Well, I mean, 
the, the, the cases where the value of truth supersedes the values of empathy and intelligence uh, is very... Uh, cases like that almost never happen in society, in today's society, I think. So truth is a secondary virtue for sure, because it's incredibly important. But um, we have to keep in mind that somehow, sometimes, uh, E and I are positive and truth is negative, and the E and I supersede the T. I will say, however, the reason I put it in the secondary, uh, the secondary virtue category is because I feel like people being honest and truthful more often than not is incredibly useful to society and incredibly good in maximizing E in the long run. Again, like I said, in the long run. Like, if a person has a flaw and that flaw is preventing them from moving forward in life, then you should tell them the truth to an extent. You know, do it nicely out of empathy, of course, but tell them the truth because if they know what their flaw is, the idea is that they can overcome their flaw and reflect upon it, rather than lying to them in that case. You see, lying to them doesn't benefit them in the long run. You know, once you take C into account, the consequences, then saying the truth makes a whole lot of sense. This is most cases. Most cases in society, truth is almost always good. Again, unless there's cases where the consequence literally doesn't uh, is not affected by the truth, like the case where a person is, is dying. Like, whether you tell them the truth or not, they will still die, so there the truth doesn't really matter. Or cases where there's, again, where the consequence is, is certain, and there's no, uh... Where the consequence is certain, and the consequence is not affected by the truth. Pretty much. Where the consequence, where the change in EC and IC and uh, TC is small... Sorry, where the change in EC is very small whether you tell the truth or not. Where the change in EC is small, if uh, whether you tell the truth or not, even if TA is, is negative and TC is negative, it doesn't matter. If the change in E is small, that's a case where I would say E, uh, that's a case where I would say the truth, the, the, the empathy and the intelligence supersedes the truth. Now the last thing within uh, this thing is the virtue of scientific progress for well-being. Now that's obvious and why that should be there because Obviously, we want, to do, we want to be honest with the environment. We want to know about the environment so to help ourselves survive. The reason I include it into... I mean, it's actually more part of intelligence than it is a part of T, but... Actually, yeah, it's definitely part of intelligence than T. And I'll put it in, uh, into intelligence, but just take that into account that uh, we have to include here the scientific progress uh, for the sake of the well-being of society because that's important, because we need to progress scientifically in order for E to apply. Hell, for E to even apply the way I defined it to apply, for E to apply perfectly, you need to have neural interfaces, and you need to have the internet, and you need to have this way for people to all communicate at once and process all that information. So, obviously, there should be stuff in here. Basically, what I want to say, overall, is that E is empathy in itself. E is the primary virtue that we always want to appeal to. I and T... The reason I call them secondary virtues is that they are virtues whose whole purpose is to enhance E in the long run. Their whole purpose is to make us so that we can apply the formula properly. So we can apply the formula properly and appeal to E as much as we possibly can. That's the purpose of I and T. That's the purpose of I and T. I is intrinsically good because I... And T is intrinsically good because these two things give us more of E in the long run, if you think about it, right? I mean, they're intrinsically good just, just in and of themselves as well, but they are good in a practical sense because uh, EC is going to be higher if IA and I and TA and IC and TC are higher. If TA, if I, sorry, if IC and TC are higher, then EC will, be all, will also be higher. I mentioned these are functions. This function is act actually depends, this function depends on these functions. It depends on them. I mean, it's a consequence. Like, the consequence... Okay. <laughs> consequences obviously depend on, uh, uh, like, the consequences down here, but y you have to keep in mind that a society that is intelligent as well as empathetic is better than a society that is simply empathetic or simply intelligent. <sighs> Let's talk about tertiary virtues. Oh, my neck. Okay, so the last category are basically the virtues that affect this stuff very little. But we like them intrinsically anyway because they appeal to our human nature.
Okay, they don't necessarily affect the empathy of society, they don't necessarily make society more intelligent, not in a way that's easy to calculate, they don't affect the uh, truth value in society, they are simply done because people like the stuff here. Um, this sounds very arbitrary, uh, sorry, this sounds very vague right now, and that's because it is vague, because this category is basically everything that human beings like to do that is not, whose purpose is not the survival and well-being of the species. Right? Everything here is everything we like to do, everything we like to do, within reason, of course, that doesn't add to our survival in a, a big way, and doesn't add to our, uh, it doesn't add to our, uh, it doesn't add to our survival or well-being in a big way. It doesn't add to E in a big way. Oh, by the way, when I mentioned that I and T add to E, I meant they add to E in, in the unforeseeable category. That's what I meant. They add to E, they, they add, they add more to E in the, in the uh, unforeseeable category. Not the foreseeable category. The foreseeable category is independent. I was wrong when I said before that this function depends on this. It does not. This function is independent. But the unforeseeable category, the long run, like the stuff you don't predict, is affected by I, C, and T, C. Anyway, just, you know, just in principle, that's, that's a fact. So yeah, the stuff here is basic. Okay, so if you've ever read Scott McCloud, Understanding Comics, uh, he, uh, he defines art as um, anything human beings like to do that is not, whose purpose is not uh, survival and reproduction. Now I, so I generalize that to say anything whose purpose is not survival and uh, well-being. Not reproduction, I don't care about that, but survival and well-being. Everything here is stuff that doesn't depend on survival and well-being. Obviously reproduction, obviously well-being depends on reproduction to an extent, because survival depends on reproduction, but we're not going to talk about reproduction explicitly. It, it, it's not a big thing. This, this category here is everything that is left once we have ensured that everybody on the planet is happy, everybody on the planet is intelligent, so that to ensure that we stay happy and everybody on the planet is truthful, to again ensure that we stay happy, and everybody on the planet is willing to do scientific progress uh, for the sake of ensuring continued happiness of human, human beings. Mm. Sorry. Right. So that's what it is. So pretty much, this is art. The, this tertiary virtues are the art virtues, and I literally do call them that, the art virtues. This category is 100% art. All of art is here. Now, by the way, so you want to think, so art obviously, uh, obviously talks about human behavior. And there's this weird, like, there's this weird mysticism in society where people think that science and art are, like, separate things, which is weird because they're not at all. Uh, I think that's because of, like, of Dan Brown's, like, Angels and Demons books that people believe that, but it's completely not true. You know, I, I, um, you know, I, I, I uh, go to university, and I went to some people and random, you know, people that I know, rather, and I asked them questions like, well, what do you think about the difference between science and art? I just asked them the vague, because I have my own opinions, but I asked them, and their immediate response was, those two aren't mutually exclusive. You know, if you do physics, you know, you will have physicists talk about the beauty of physics and the beauty of equations, and if you do math, people will talk about the beauty of formulas and the structure and the, the axioms and all the, the beauty and the abstractness and all that. And if you, if you help, if you listen to Richard Dawkins, uh, do speeches on YouTube, you know, all of his speeches in, in the halls with all the people, he will say stuff like, there is beauty in science. Science is beautiful, beautiful. If you can attribute beauty to it, then it's art. And yes, that does mean science is entirely contained within art. I will say that right here. S is contained within A. And this is like curvy A. Curvy A meaning art. That's what this category is. It's a curvy A. And yes, that's what we have here, first of all. This S. Science. Science for science's sake, that is. Science for science's sake. This is one of the obvious things that would be a tertiary virtue, you know? Once we've assured human well-being and intelligence and truth, we could do science for science's sake, right? There's no problem with that. The problem is when science for science's sake gets in the way of all this other stuff, which can happen. There's a lot of sci-fi based on that, actually, where the, uh, the need to do science and discover leads people to uncover, uh, people forget how to be cautious 
and they discover things that destroy them. For instance, the movies Alien, the Alien movies, that's a great example of that, where science has gotten in the way of empathy, right? Where science has gotten in the way of well-being. Empathy and well-being are synonymous for the most part in this uh, framework. So yeah, we have SM, SA, and SC, and SX. Yeah, you know what, I'm not even going to try to make these legible anymore, but yeah, if you can read them, great. Science is the obvious thing here. Um, and especially if you think about it, another thing I have to just point out about the science thing is that, you know, we think about scientists in a romanticized way. We think about scientists as these people on the frontier who uh, really want to help people and, and, and fix the world, but that's not what they are. If you go to a university, if you work with scientists, or if you, like, if you go to their classes, or observe them at all, you're basically going to figure out that they're not, their motivation is selfish. Their motivation, well, their motivation is artistic. Their motivation is because they like science for science's sake, especially in math. Mathematicians love math for math's sake. Math especially is like the cornerstone of this. Math isn't even in this category. S, this S specifically, I'm, I'm thinking of science that you can make a paper on. Math itself is more of like a, a, an artistic thing, like a, a, like, a, like a classical artistic thing, like like painting or something is, is more what math looks like. There's actually essays on the internet about how people say that math is art and not science, but I say science is art and not science, right? Because it is. Because people who do science, their motivation is science for science's sake. It's not science to help the world, although some of it is definitely that, and the fact that they still help the world is a good thing, but in general, it's science for science's sake. And I'm saying that that is intrinsically virtuous, which is why, uh, it's a virtue on the board, right? So that's science. Um, let's talk about other, all this stuff. Philosophy. Now, this is a weird one because I mentioned in my other video that philosophy was largely bullshit. That doesn't mean it's, it's a bad discipline. That doesn't mean I'm against it as a discipline. Oh, science, by the way, contains like every discipline imaginable, every intellectual discipline. Implies like social sciences, even the humanities to an extent. Political science it includes uh, it includes psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, you know, women's studies, all that stuff. You know, although I don't, I think women's studies is you mostly nonsense. But you know, all the stuff within like all that massive social science category is all contained within S. It, math is not contained within S. Neither is some like applied math and theoretical physics, but uh, S in general is a massive, massive category. Philosophy is a much smaller category. Philosophy deals with wisdom as opposed to intelligence. It deals with, you know, uh, stuff that requires deductive logic more than inductive logic. Because that's the methodology for science, it's just inductive logic. As the criteria for science. Uh, right, well, wait, so philosophy, I'm gonna say that P. I'm gonna put that up here. P, PM, PA, PC, PX. I'm actually going to erase this. This is getting in the way. I'm almost done here, guys. Well, I'm almost done finishing the board. Why philosophy? I think that's pretty obvious if you think about it. Philosophy is... it's incredibly important because it's like... it's food for the brain. You know, it keeps your brain working, keeps you thinking, keeps you wondering. You need to, to have a philosophical mindset to, to, to watch a video like this, I would just say. You know, philosophy, it's, it, I wouldn't say it supersedes science, but um, it's definitely up there, it's definitely a virtue, and it's definitely unique enough as a discipline that it warrants its own category. What other stuff belongs up there on the list? I, I actually don't know everything that belongs on the list. This is all largely theoretical. I mean, I've thought about this stuff for a while, but the tertiary categories, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the tertiary category, you know? Any number of stuff can go there. I, there's gonna be like a dot 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 here. Like, if you come up with stuff, by all means, tell me. So, okay, the third thing I want to mention is, uh, artistic stuff. And I mean classic art. This includes your, uh, your, your painting, your music, uh, film, books, literature, uh, video games, uh, what else? Poetry, which is, uh, within literature. Uh, math, like I said, which is, you could argue is also within literature, but I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to give that A, symbol A, A-M, no, you know what, I'm not going to give that A, because we have already used A, I'm going to give this the symbol of, uh, which symbol should I give it? 
uh, alpha. Alpha M, alpha A, alpha C, alpha X. Wow. Uh, I wonder if you guys can even read the stuff at the bottom. Eh, good enough. Again, it doesn't even matter if you don't. If you, if you... You know what? No, it does. I'm gonna... Just give me a second. I'm gonna re rewrite this in a way that's legible. It's only gonna take a second. E, M. E, oh, sorry. Eh. I, M. I, T. Uh, sorry. T, M. Jesus. S, M. P, M. And Alpha, M. And then up here, we have E A, uh, I A, T A, S A, P A, and then Alpha A. And then over here, we have uh, E C, uh, I C, T C, S C, P C, Alpha C. And I'm not going to bother with the X column because you know what that is. So yeah, art. That's that's basically what I include there. Um, math should actually be its own category because the difference between math and most other art is that uh, people generally agree on what the quality of a math paper is, but people will always disagree on what the quality of an artistic thing is. And I actually want to mention, my, my like the whole purpose of this channel when I started was to talk about the tertiary virtues, what I think of as tertiary virtues. The art, uh, virtues, I guess, like I said. Excuse me. So, again, I'm trying to think of any other virtues that would go up on the list. Oh, this also includes video making. Like making videos on YouTube. Uh, like what I'm doing right now. Okay. Videos on YouTube have a moral value. Yes, they do. And you need to calculate that moral value in order to figure out whether a video making channel is good or not, whether it has, whether it satisfies X, uh, whether it satisfies, whether it maximizes X, so to speak, for that individual. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything more I should put on this list, and off the top of my head, I can't think of anything other than the obvious stuff, philosophy, science, art, classic art. Um, see if there's anything else that goes up there. You know what? No, nothing else goes out there because this this last alpha for what I'm trying to tell you guys it, it it's a broad enough category that uh, anything can factor in the alpha. So I I, I want to apply the formula now and actually calculate these things not numerically again but calculate them intuitively and to give you guys good values of x and what is an example of good behavior or not. In my opinion, again, this is all very very subjective as we all agree, but I think a lot of us can agree that. Uh, that this is how we should, that this is how we in general categorize things. This is how in general human beings categorize things. I'm just sort of trying to formalize it, right? The one thing, oh. yeah, yeah. And, and we're back. I'm sorry if the camera angle adjusted itself a little bit. You're just gonna have to deal with that. All right. So let's actually apply the formula, and I want to do this a few times just to uh, emphasize the point and sort of get you guys to understand what my thinking is. Okay. Let's say you wrote a scientific paper, and you care about the scientific paper for obvious reasons, and I shredded it, and my motivation was I just wanted to destroy your paper. Now let's apply the formula. So okay, let's say for whatever reason, I still have empathy for you, even though I do this, okay? Which is possible, okay? It's possible. In a weird way, you would think it's not possible if I'm intelligent, but let's say it is possible. Let's say I'm insane. Okay, let's say I'm insane and I have empathy for you even though I destroy something that you hold dear. Maybe I don't know that you hold it dear, whatever. It, then EM is going to be positive, right? Because I have empathy for you when I do it. What's going EA going to be? Okay, so EA is the intrinsic empathy value of me destroying your paper. Now, given that I'm taking something away from you that you care about, that has a negative empathy value because you care about this thing. Like EA literally depends on nothing other than how much you care about the thing that you lose or gain. If it's something you gain or something a society gains that society cares about, then there's more empathy. By the way, this isn't just about you as well. This is something society cares about. Society cares about your papers. There's a tiny bit of empathy uh, 
that gets added on. So, so, so it's even more negative because not only am I robbing you of the paper, I'm robbing society of the paper. That's the that's an interesting fact. The, the the robbing you part is a lot bigger than the robbing society part, but both are negative. So overall, this value is negative. Now we have EC. What's EC? Well. We don't actually know because it depends on what the paper is about, but the assumption is that the paper is adding to science and based on research. So we can assume that the paper is good to society. So therefore, this is uh, I am preventing society from having a paper that adds to society's science. Uh, oh, since it takes away from science, so yeah, that's that's bad. I'm I'm, I'm taking away something that society cares about. I'm also taking away something you care about. So. Given that I take away your paper because I shredded it, you know, you now don't have the paper. You now either have to recreate the paper, rewrite it, so you have to work to rewrite it, or uh, the fact that I destroyed the paper, maybe you can't meet some deadline in your job of writing the scientific paper and this affects your career. So this is also negative. Now what's EX? Okay, so this is the complicated part, but there's actually a scaling issue here. You have to keep in mind that A and C, th these values are generally bigger than these values. Okay, M is small. M is small compared to this. And these all, all these things have the same units, but M has to be small. Why? Because if you think about it, M is only so much information, right? The whole point of M, like I said, is that M uh, makes the absolute value of U lower, okay? The unforeseeable consequences. If we know what you're motivated by, then the unforeseeable consequences of what you do are less. There, there, there's less unforeseeable stuff. You know, this, uh, the, the motivation, your motivation being good increases AEA and EC in the long run, in the unforeseeable section. So that's why motivation, uh, th th that's the point of, motiva of having the motivation criterion. But the motivation is still small. You know, my problem with uh, a lot of ethical thinking is that people don't take motivation into account. Okay, they act like it doesn't matter. Now, the motivation matters. Now, I, I guarantee you, you would feel different if someone did something to you out of love or if they did something to you out of hate, okay? It just feels different. So there has to be, there has to be an empathy of motivation thing. That's actually another element of this. Because, you know, if you feel better, given that I did this out of love, then you don't feel, then there's a positive empathy value to that. If you, whereas if, if you feel worse that I did it out of hate, then there's a negative empathy value to that. You know, EM and EA can be positive, but, Motivation matters, that's the point of it. It matters, it doesn't matter as much as the action itself and the consequence, but it still matters. That's why this column is here. Just the scaling is that it's less. So EX is basically gonna be negative. Just intuitively in general, we can assume it's gonna be negative because, I mean, we don't know how big they are, but we know that in principle, EA and EC are bigger than EM, therefore it's negative, okay? EX is negative. Oh, another thing. Another scaling issue is if when we move down. I'm gonna do this row by row because that's easier. But when we move down, these values down here are less than the values up here. Another obvious scaling issue. This is because E is the primary virtue. Empathy is the primary virtue. Uh, intelligence, truth are secondary and these other things are tertiary. So obviously these things matter in general more than the stuff, sorry, less than the stuff that's up here. In general, the higher values are up here. Well, actually I would say that uh, the, the intrinsic action is probably where the highest values are. This is the, uh, th this is the function that grows the most and, and, and decreases the most out of all. Consequence, the consequences are weird. Consequences can jump all over the place. Uh, yeah, yeah, they can jump all over the place, so we don't really know whether this is gonna be positive or negative, but we know that M is gonna be a lot smaller than A, the absolute value. Like, there's an upper limit, there's, there's an upper bound to M, as opposed to A, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. So th th this is definitely going to have less of an effect on X than E, but we still need to calculate it because it, it depends on these functions and depends on what we do in general. You know, there's some actions, there are some actions that have high values down here and low values up here. You know, so we have to keep that in mind. So intelligence. So the question here is, I am, is my motivation intelligent? If what I'm motivated to do is to shred your paper and I use a shredder, and I'm motivated to do it intelligently if I have the intelligence to do it then, or to, if my motivation is to be intelligent while I do it, then this is positive. Right off the bat, this is positive. That's a little weird to think about because you think about it, uh, you know, how can you factor intelligence into motivation? It's easy to factor intelligence into action and consequence, but are my motivations, can they be intelligent? Not? Yes, they can. 
you know, my motivations, I can be smart about it, I can be uh, not smart about it. If I want to be smart about it, if, if my motivation is to do it intelligently, you know, which requires some self-awareness or not, uh, this is almost definitely positive. If my motivation is not to be intelligent, if my motivation is to be stupid, it just simply whether because I am stupid, whether because I want to be stupid for stupid sake, then this is going to be negative. IA. The intrinsic intelligence value of the action itself. Well, given that I shredded your paper, and given that shredding is the most efficient way of doing that, then this is positive as well. Right? Because, again, what, this, what is this measure? This is a measure of how intelligent the actual action itself is. Not how intelligent my motivation is, or whether I want to adhere to intelligence, but how intelligent the action is. The intelligence of the consequences. This one's weird, because my motivation was to shred your paper. So the consequences of you shredding your paper are that your paper is shredded. Now, obviously, now there's a diff there's a subtlety here, right? Because you could think about it like, well, what if what I wanted to do was to prevent you from publishing the paper? Because if that's what my motivation was, then this is more complicated because I, can, I haven't prevented you from publishing the papers. Uh, presumably the paper is saved on your computer and I can still, you could still publish it again quite easily. So the consequences here are not intelligent because I wasn't intelligent about preventing you from publishing the paper. But if my motivation was simply to, per to burn the paper that was there, then the consequences here are basically net zero because I, I accomplished what I was going to do. Uh, right, this is has to, and again, this is the intelligence of the consequences. This value is almost always going to be very low. It's just, it's, it's... See, okay, I might actually be even confusing myself, but the whole point of I is to preserve intelligence in principle. Intelligence, not intelligence for intelligence's sake, and scientific progress for well-being's sake. That's what this category is. So, if I adhere to those principles in the, co in the future, if I adhere to the principles in the present, and if I adhere to the principles in the past, then I is always going to be positive, for the most part, right? That's actually another way to think about this, is that consequences are future, A is present, M is past. That, that, that's one way to think about it. Excuse me. I just gotta take a drink. Oh. I ran out of coffee, so I might be slowing down in a second. Uh, right, so... This is... I'm just saying, in, in principle, because since I am adhering to intelligence and I am intelligent in the past, I want to be intelligent about it, I'm intelligent when I do the thing and I want to be intelligent in the future, then intelligence is satisfied. If I'm unintelligent in the past, I'm not motivated to be intelligent. If I am unintelligent when I burn the paper and I'm un By the way, this, this, I, I was thinking about this earlier, that this, this, this doesn't actually, this doesn't necessarily have to do with the methodology that I used, okay? Because even if I shred the paper, I can be against the idea of intelligence while I'm doing it. I can be stupid and still shred the paper and still figure out how to do that. See, th this is the flaw with the system is that all of these things are very hard to calculate. Intelligence, dep the intelligence value, the value of IA, it depends on, it depends on how intelligent I was about doing the thing that I did, and it depends on whether or not I am adhering to the virtue of intelligence, right? This is all a virtue, okay? What that means is intelligence in and of itself, intrinsically, is good. And if I am not adhering to that virtue while I do it, as in I am a stupid individual that's still figured out how to shred the paper, there is a positive value to, there is a, IA is a function, right? IA is, there's a positive component to IA, given that I figured out how to burn the paper, but there's a negative value to IA, given that I am, in a, a, a stupid individual, I do not actually want uh, to adhere to intelligence while I'm doing it, right? Or, or I am incapable of being intelligent, okay? And obviously intelligence is a measure, this is based on like, this is not absolute intelligence necessarily, this could be based on just human cognition in general, and given that I'm not an intelligent person while I do it, I'm not intelligent uh, but in this sense. But yeah, this is not easy to calculate at all. And the IC is, of course, are the in, in, in the consequences, am I adhering to the virtue of intelligence? That's what it's a question of. Am I adhering to the virtue of intellig intelligence? And am I behaving in an intelligent way? Again, so, so this, is also, this is also depends on several things. This depends on whether I adhere to intelligence and whether I want to adhere to intelligence. Whether I adhere to the intelligence virtue simply because I'm an intelligent individual 
or because I do intelligent things. Because there's a difference, right? I can do intel I can do intelligent things, but be an idiot, and I can be an idiot. Uh, I could do intelligent things and be an idiot, or I can do stupid things and adhere and be an intelligent person. These are possibilities, and you have to add those two and, and factor that in. So there's a lot of work in calculating I, because it, you you have to think about whether I am doing something that isn't that is intelligent and intelligently, and I have to think about whether I believe in, in being intelligent in principle. Because if, I, if I'm an intelligent person and if I'm doing something intelligent, okay, because I could be doing something stupid and still be a smart person. That, this is possible. For instance, um, well, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but you can imagine yourself that you can do something, a person can do a stupid thing while still being a smart person, right? So this, this I value doesn't depend just on whether you do something in a smart way, right? Let's move on. Um, yeah, and the I, just thinking about this more, I could be wrong, it could be better, more refined way to just say that the motivation to be intelligent, to be an intelligent person, is just I am, and it's the value of I am, and I A and I C are uh, questions of whether what I did was intelligence and whether what I do in the future as a consequence is intelligent. That could be a more refined way of thinking about it. Because then I am is literally a question of how much of the virtue of intelligence I appeal, um, I believe in, how much, it, it's literally a measure of how intelligent I am, I am. And I A is a measure of how, how intelligently I burn the paper, and I C is a measure of how intelligently I act after I burn the paper. That could be a more refined way of doing it. I actually can't think straight right now, so I don't know if that would be the best case. Again, this is all, this isn't like set in stone any of it. This is just a, a very, a general framework. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, actually, you know, that I think about it, uh, that, that probably is a better way to think about it. I am is a measure of how intelligent I am, right, my motivation. No, you know what, no, 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 it's not, because I am is a, uh, could be a measure of how intelligently I want to go about this and how intelligent I am, because those two could be different. You know, I can be an intelligent person and still want, and still have the motivation to go about burning your paper in a stupid way, right? So you have to keep those two separate. You have to keep the intrinsic intelligence of my action, which is my intelligence as I go into the thing, separate from how intelligently I do something, because for whatever reason, those two values can be different. So you have to think about that. Uh, let's talk about T, secondary virtue. Sorry, I, I talked about the intelligence thing way too much, but you get the idea. This is not an easy thing to calculate. TM, TA, TC. Okay, so TM is, am I being honest while I do the thing? This is kind of interesting, and it honestly depends, it, it depends on whether I'm doing the burning of the paper in front of this person, that I, you know, if I'm doing it in front of you while I burned your paper and I just took it and burned it, am I doing it honestly, or am I doing it behind your back? If I'm completely honest about it, uh, honestly, the, the TM takes its highest value when I tell you that I'm going to burn your paper before I do it. You know, that's when my motivation is high. That's when my the truth value of my motivation is highest, and of course this factors in to my desire to be honest. T A. Uh, this is again. This is this is uh, this is if I'm honest while I'm doing the thing. Okay. T M is if I'm motivated to be honest with you about it. T A is whether I'm actually honest with you when I do it. Though, so yeah, these can both be positive. I'm actually thinking whether they can both, whether one can be positive, one can be... Can you be motivated to be honest, but act in a way that is dishonest? Because you don't, because that's how your decision-making process works. I think it is, actually, yeah. These can be different. TM, these can have opposite sign. TA can be positive, TM can be negative. You know, or TM can be... Hell, I can have the motivation. Yeah, yeah, because TM, TM is just a measure of how much I want to appeal to the honesty virtue, right? To the truth virtue. So if I want to appeal to the, so if I believe in truth in general, then TM, if, if I believe, actually, no, 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 this, this, this all depends on the action specifically. So do I, so yeah, it's a little, it's, it's not obvious whether TM and TA can have opposite sign. I think if I believe that, if I believe in being honest with you about what I'm doing, but in but in practice I am dishonest when I do it. That doesn't seem to add up. Like if I believe in being honest with you, why wouldn't I be honest with you about it? You know, if I believe if I if I if you if I burn your paper, right? If I go up to you and I say, 
okay? I am going to burn your paper, okay? That is me having a positive value of TM. I believe in being truthful to you, and I am in practice. Then I actually, but it wouldn't make sense for me afterwards to not burn your paper in front of you. Actually, no, 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 it would, it would, because here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can say that I am, I can be motivated to burning the paper in front of you and being honest about it. I'm actually confusing myself, hold on. I'm actually, honestly, I'm most confused about these, the two, the, the secondary virtues. It's really not obvious when you, how you apply them. So help me guys a little bit if you have a better idea for how this works. Uh, I and I, t okay, so I have intelligence figured out more or less, but do I have T figured out? I guess this, okay, so I feel like this works in a way where for, for, for TA and TM to have opposite sign, I have to desire, I have to be honest with you in motivation. I have to appeal, I have to appeal to the honesty virtue. There has to be an honesty value to my motivation. But in practice, the action itself is dishonest because it doesn't happen while you're aware of it. Mm, yeah, I think that that can be possible. Don't quote me on that. I could, this could be wrong, but I think it's in practice. It is possible to be honest in my motivation, but dishonest in the action itself for whatever reason. For whatever reason, it is possible, theoretically. Maybe I'm just bad at understanding what honesty is. Maybe I want to be honest with you, but I don't actually understand honesty that well, and somehow when I do the thing, when I do the burning of the paper, I do it behind your back, and therefore it is not happening in front of your eyes, therefore it is a dishonest action in itself. That's what TA is a measure of. It's a measure of, it's a measure of whether I am truthful to you in my behavior. Because I could be motivated to be truthful, but still not be truthful. Actually, yeah, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, like, I could be motivated to be honest with a person, but in practice, I could be completely dishonest with them because I'm emotionally incapable of being honest for whatever reason, right? So yeah, mo so motivation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is literally, TA is literally a measure if I am honest with you about uh, the execution of the action. And if the action happens, yeah, if, the, if, if I tell you that I'm going to do it and I do it and you're aware of it, right? If you are somehow, you can figure out that I'm doing it and I let you know. TM is literally a question of whether I wanted to tell you. That's all TM is. TM is a question of whether I wanted to tell you and wanted to let you know about what I was doing. Okay, and TC is, on, is, is if I'm honest with you in the future. That's what TC is. TC is obvious. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I figured it out. I'm sorry, guys. So I figured it out. So TM is literally, do I want to be honest with you? TA is, am I actually honest with you when I do the thing? Because those two don't necessarily coincide. I can want to be honest with you, but still not be honest with you because uh, I'm crazy or something, or because uh, something came up, or because there's an emotional thing that came up um, in, in my mind and that prevented me from being honest with you in, in, in principle. So yeah, this is a med so TA would then be a measure of just the honesty of the execution of the action. Okay, so that's this stuff figured out. So basically what we figured out is that TM, TA, TC can all be positive, right? I M I A and I C can all be positive. So uh, <laughs> rather I X and T X. I actually wrote this wrong. Hold on. I X T X S X P X Alpha X. So I X and T X can both be positive, and E X is definitely negative. See, that's a little weird. This is why I mentioned earlier that I don't like societies built on intelligence as a primary virtue because this being positive, you can still do bad stuff. Whereas E X being negative is the important thing. You get high values of X with intelligence being a primary virtue. Um, and basically calling it a primary virtue just means that this value is higher than these values in general, right? And IX and TX, uh, they, they can easily be positive in this case because I can be honest, I can, I can desire to be honest with you about the burning of the paper, I can be honest with you in practice and burn the paper in front of you, and I can be honest with you about it in the future. So literally, and I can be intelligent about it in practice and in, and in the future, and I can be intelligent about it in motivation. So these IX, TX can be positive, EX is negative. Okay, let's move on to the stuff down here. Okay, so science, S. This is science for science's sake, as I defined earlier. S, M, S, A, and S, C. 
Now SM, strangely enough, SM can be positive. It's fucked up, but it can be positive. I can be positive, I can still desire to, to want science for science's sake, even though I burn the paper. Again, this is, this, this is not a paradox because, uh, the reason this isn't a paradox is because human motivation is in itself contradictory. Like, the actions a person take and the motivation can, con can clash, which is why the, the signs of M and A and the S, M and S, A can contradict one another pretty, and this happens for all the rows categorically, right? And it can happen pretty often, which is just one of something important. Now, SA is definitely negative, 100% negative, because this is a scientific paper that I burned, and I'm preventing it from going out into the ether, so there is, there's definitely going to be a small negative value here. And SC, also negative, because now there is a paper that is delayed from being put out. So, negative, negative, SX is going to be negative because of the scaling thing. Uh, philosophy. So, okay, philosophy is kind of weird. <laughs> You might argue immediately that these are all zero, but they're actually not, because strangely enough, with all human behavior, a percentage, the, the, there's a percentage, there's a small value for each category that goes into it. Okay, technically I'm still appealing to philosophy with my action. Technically I'm still appealing, because think about it, if I do something like burn the paper, now people can sit there and think about and philosophize about my behavior when I burnt the paper of my friend, right? You know, this, the behavior itself, merits philosophical discussion, which is why PC is positive. PA is positive, because people can philosophize about it while I'm doing it, and people can want to philosophize, or I can philosophize about it, so PM is positive. So PA could be positive. And because art is such an abstract idea, the alpha M's can all be positive. But here's the reason, here's the problem. These, okay, because of scaling, these are all very small. And because of general scaling, these are all very small, this is high, very, and by mean high, it's very negative, so x is going to be negative. That's arbitrary, and the scaling thing is arbitrary, but you have to, this is the, this is the stuff we can debate, but I think we can all agree that in general, you know, this is what it would be. One thing I wanted to note, in the scientific paper example, we don't actually know in, in uh, the consequences whether the paper would appeal to scientific masses or not. Maybe the paper was completely bullshit. Right? Maybe the paper would only would only uh, act as a distraction for scientists and not draw science forward. Then SC would be negative. But see, the problem is, well, the issue with that is that it's not predictable. So this wouldn't actually be factored into SC. Okay. Whenever a scientific paper gets done, I think th I think the formula for this is to assume that the scientific paper is by default has a positive value in SC, not a negative one. Because if if the paper is wrong and bad. Uh, then that just happens to be an unforeseeable consequence. You know, that would be within the U category, which I didn't write right here. It would be in the U category, and not factored in here. Uh, so that's it. Oh, because this is a scientific matter as well, PX and alpha X are smaller than SX. Although in general, I want to point out how SX, PX, and alpha X have the similar scaling. They're not uh, much smaller than these, than these three things up here. Okay, in general, in general, just in general, the scaling here is smaller than the scaling here, is smaller than the scaling there. Okay, that's how it works. And whether the scaling here is bigger, and wh whether the scaling of one variable in the tertiary virtues is smaller bigger than the other scaling in tertiary virtues depends on the thing itself. Like in this case, we're talking about science, so obviously the, the philosophy and uh, artistic scaling, our artistic values are going to be less than the SX values. But they are not zero. That's the important thing to note. They're not zero. They can be infinitesimally small. They will never be zero because zero uh, implies that no action was ever done. But because you do anything, like even if this is a vacuum and there's a paper, a scientific paper in it, then that is a scientific paper that can be philosophized about and it's a scientific paper that has artistic merit because art is an arbitrary idea to begin with, right? So that's a scientific paper example. Uh, let's think about other examples. What else? What other examples do we have? We could... So yeah, that was, that was an obvious scientific paper example. Okay, you know what, let's talk about things that have negative x values, because this obvious uh, negative x values, well, not obvious, but, you know, the, the, the publishing of a scientific paper is almost generally going to be a positive value here, because think about it. The empathy side of it is that society and the person who publishes the paper care about it, so all of these are positive, for obvious reasons. The intelligence and I am 
the, 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 the intelligence and truth thing, the truth is obviously going to be positive because you're going to be honest within the paper and about the fact that you uh, are creating a paper. The intelligence uh, values are all going to be positive because you're going about it intelligently and you basically have to have some minimum amount of intelligence to even write a paper. So there's an assumed positive value for M, for I. Again, I, it's really not obvious how you calculate I, but it's going to be positive. And the stuff down here, S, X, obviously going to be positive. PX, almost definitely going to be positive because you can philosophize about scientific matters. And because science, because you can talk about the beauty and the aesthetic of science, right? Actually, I'm going to call alpha aesthetics. You can talk about the aesthetic value of, of the paper, so alpha x is also going to be positive. But in general, the scaling is, this is going to be, uh, in that, see, in that case, in that situation, the highest value for all these is actually going to be sx, right? It's going to be sx, not ex. Even though the, the, the paper matters to a lot of people, or in the very least, uh, sx is going to be of similar magnitude. It's going to be on the same order of magnitude that ex is going to be. Because the scientific paper appeals to science, to science for science's sake a lot. And the empathy thing appeals a lot by virtue of the fact that it's empathy. But I think because, because you're publishing a scientific paper, you know, you're doing science in its most incarnate form, this has to be very, very, very high, uh, right? Because you're appealing to science as high as you could possibly be. That's what a paper is. So it has to be on the same order of magnitude. Again, that's just like some arbitrary scaling thing that I'm putting out. Again, the scaling is, whoops, scaling is very, very important. Uh, these will obviously be smaller, and T and I uh, will also be smaller than EX for obvious reasons. That's if a, a scientific paper gets published. Let's talk about not obvious artistic aesthetic stuff. How do we apply the formula to an aesthetic, to, to something that happens aesthetically, right? Okay, so so for, for this to even work, you have to have an idea of what constitutes good art and bad art. Good aesthetics, bad aesthetics. Imagine for a second, and we can all agree, we can all agree on the, what constitutes good and bad art, for the most part. For the most part, all intelligent people, assuming we satisfy virtues one to three, we can agree on what constitutes positive art and bad art. Oh, that's an actually important point. Can these be negative values? Can the stuff down here be negative? That's an important question because it's not obvious, and I think it can because, because of our notion of uh, artistic quality, there's definitely art that is intrinsically bad, right? Intrinsically bad. Like, if it existed in a vacuum, that vacuum would suck, right? Imagine this. Imagine I, I photograph a piece of uh, human excrement. Nasty, okay? But, but I have to think of an example like that because that's an obvious example. That has an intrinsically negative artistic value. It is intrinsically negative in alpha A and intrinsically negative in alpha C because now the photograph exists and is on the internet and who cares about my motivations? Even if my motivations are positive, I'm retarded if I think that that's good art just because whatever. So this is going to be negative. In fact, this is going to be really negative and the E factors in how much people care about it and there's obviously going to be clashing. You know, some people might say, oh, this is a brilliant work of art. Other people might, might say, you know, this is terrible. So, uh, calculating EX is going to be complicated. And this doesn't take intelligence at all, so yeah, IX is probably going to be... I, see, for, for stuff that's purely, like, classic art like this, these values are going to be pretty small because they don't... It doesn't necessarily take much intelligence or, or uh, much truth in order to do something like that. You know, these, these are modifiers to the total value of X, but for the most part, they don't affect artistic stuff like this in today's society, right? SX is going to be positive. Technically, it's going to be positive because the very fact that there is a photograph exists, because what is science? Okay, we have to understand SX is almost going to be positive almost all the time. Okay, well, no, that's not true. That's not true. I, I lied. It's not true there's a positive modifier to SX because the very fact that something exists means that that something can be analyzed and studied. And science is the study of everything, right? Science is literally the study of everything in existence. So the very fact that uh, you can study something that is created, and if it's a piece of art that's created, you can study that work of art, then that has a positive value of SA and SC. Al well, although, although, it has a negative value, okay, 
Again, SA and SC are not easily calculated. They, to, to calculate SA, you need to add the positive of this photograph of human excrement existing because that photograph cannot be studied. There's a positive element to it, that's that. There's a negative element because the very fact that this photograph exists is anti-scientific by virtue of the fact that this is a work of art, supposedly, that adds nothing to science or doesn't adhere to scientific principles. Okay, in the very, in the, at best, I'm actually not certain about this, but at best, SA would be positive, but very, very, very small, right? Because you can study, you know, you know, here's a better example. Let's say we, let's talk about a movie. Let's talk about, let's talk about the human centipede. Horrible, horrible example, horrible movie. Let's talk about slasher movies in general, you know, that whole category of, of gore slasher films. Now, I'm going to say something that arbitrarily, Alpha A is negative for all of them incredibly negative. The very fact that these movies exist is bad. And Alpha C is negative because the very fact that they exist and continue to exist is bad, right? Intrinsically. Um, let's talk about the E value for Human Centipede and, and such films. So, the motivation can be empathetic, strangely enough, so who cares? I mean, you know what? The motivation doesn't even matter much in this case. The empathy value. Okay, given that some people like this movie, EA can be positive, but given that a lot of people don't, you know, those two ideas will clash, and to actually figure out what the total intrinsic empathy of the existence of a uh, human centipede, you actually have to think about how much dislike it brings to people and how much like it brings to people. You have to, you have to weigh those two, and given that a lot of people probably, a lot more people dislike it than like it, this is probably going to be negative. The consequence also negative because it's art that exists and continues to exist, and this is just the fact that now people have to hate it longer and like it longer. You know, this is just EA applied, you know, multiplied by the amount of time that passes, pretty much. So this is negative, this is negative, EX is negative, which is already bad. Now here's the note. Here's the note. Because this is purely art, and because art doesn't affect empathy and intelligence and well-being that much, because, you know, if I watch The Human Centipede, I will forget about it in like a week. Well, maybe longer for me, because I'm a little sensitive to stuff like that, but I'll generally forget about it in a week, and then it's not even going to matter, right? That's why EX is actually very, very small. Even though there is a lack of empathy uh, being displayed by the creation of the work, the value is small. It's small because... I'm going to wipe my face here. I look sweaty. It's small because... because compared to the artistic value, the intrinsic artistic value, this thing doesn't affect the well-being of people that much. It's just a work of art that you will, a movie that you will watch and forget about in a week. That doesn't affect, right, that doesn't affect well-being. I mentioned empathy was synonymous with well-being, so obviously EX is going to be small. Um, intelligence and, and truth, well, again, the, the TX is almost always going to be positive unless you're lying. That, that's basically, unless the, you're lying in action, and you're not really lying when you create, uh, when you create, you're not lying when you create a movie, so this is going to be positive. Although, given that the human centipede has some stuff that isn't physically human, humanly possible to an extent, right? Given that, that it's a movie, and by virtue of the fact that it's a movie, it is a caricature of real life, and hence not 100% realistic, there's a small modifier on TA that actually makes it a little bit negative. Okay, so the, my, what I'm pointing out is that each of these like values, you have to weigh the positives and the negatives. Okay, you actually really, really have to think about the variables. Okay, there's a tiny bit of negativity because it's a movie and a movie is fundamentally dishonest because it is, because it is not reality. But at the same time, it's honest in the fact that it's portraying something that it wants to portray. So you have to weigh those two. And I think in the end, TA would still be positive. Um, TC would also be positive, so would I and I, IA and IC. To an extent, because, uh, again, it requires some amount of intelligence to make a movie. It also, there, also the fact that this is the kind of movie that was made, a movie that was pretty shitty and, and, and bad and all that stuff put together, a general lack of intelligence was displayed, and on top of that, a, people who watch the movie are not filling their brains with intelligent information, hence IC can easily be negative. So you weigh that. So I think IX would actually be negative, and I think TX uh, would be positive, uh, strangely enough. But again, these are both very, very small. Even EX is small. These are still small. These are smaller than EX, but they're small in general. Now, look at SX. SX also going to be very, very small. And when I say small in this sense, I mean close to zero. 
even if it's negative, close to zero. Not, not really negative or really positive. Uh, again, my motivation is definitely not to adhere to scientific uh, values, so this is negative. SA, I'm not advancing science by much. There is a, again, there is a positive value to science because I am creating something that can be analyzed, and I'm analyzing something technically because anytime you're doing anything, your brain is thinking, and hence that appeals to science for science's sake, but there is a decrease to science for science's sake because of the fact that this movie uh, contradict science in a lot of ways. I'm sure there's stuff in the human... I haven't watched it, but I'm sure there's stuff in the human centipede that isn't scientifically active. And so if you're basing scientific data based on what's in the movie, there's a negative value to that. And the consequence is that the movie continues to exist, right? And if we base uh, our opinions of science on the movie later on in the future, that has a negative value and doesn't add... It, the movie doesn't add anything to science in the future. So, again, th this will probably be negative, but very, very small. Again, very small, because uh, a movie like The Human Centipede isn't trying to teach you anything about science, and anything it would teach you about science, you forget about it, probably, because you forget about the movie in, like, a week. SX is small. PX. Um... You know, strangely enough, even for slasher films, PX can actually be very high. If, if you think about some really weird movies like uh, the Serbian film, PX can strangely be high in that sense. However, uh, because PA can be very high, right? And PC is high because this thing continues to exist and continues to be analyzed. And PM, I, I know for a fact that the people who made Human Centipede are not motivated by to, to, to be philosophically cool. The people who made Serbian film might be, but whatever. And lastly, we have Alpha. Okay, so, the, again, the motivation here to be, to, to add to an aesthetic is negative because it was not the motivation to add to a good aesthetic. This is completely arbitrary, by the way. This is just my belief that movies like slasher films have incredibly highly negative values over, down here in this last row. Alpha A is incredibly negative, incredibly negative. The, the literal fact that this movie has to exist for one second within reality, within the universe, is horrible. This is incredibly negative, and it's much higher in magnitude than all the other values. This is even more negative because this is the movie existing for a long period of time on the internet, and people talking about it. So Alpha A, including this right here, there's actually, I mean, there's some positive philosophical value to what I'm saying right now, but overall, it's negative. So this is incredibly negative, so X is incredibly negative. Okay, that's kind of how you analyze art. With art, the stuff up here is small, the stuff down here is... the, the, the stuff down here is big, because art can add to... art can be sciencey, philosophical, and aesthetic, right? But the stuff out here is definitely going to be small compared to that. That's kind of what I want to point out. The, the only times that E, I, and T can be really big is when the thing itself really, really, really affects or concerns the well-being of society. Because if it really concerns the well-being and the intelligence, if it affects the well-being, the intelligence, and how the honesty of society, then the values of these are high. The values of the first three rows. The bottom three rows are usually what I like to talk about is just the, the intrinsic artistic values. But you understand that uh, you have to understand that this is all very, very subjective because how big and high these values are depends on my personal beliefs, my personal beliefs on how high and low artistic value, intrinsic artistic values are when we talk about art. Let's talk about other art. You know, th that was a pretty uh, bad example, something like The Human Centipede. But I, I would say in general, horror films or gore films, films whose purpose is to unappeal have Alpha A as incredibly negative. Incredibly, incredibly negative. Even if a lot of people like it. Which is why I don't like those films. Horror films can have a high, can actually have a positive Alpha A, but again, Alpha A, uh, Alpha A depends on, uh, it depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on the intrinsic artistic value of the work itself. Like, if this work existed in a vacuum, what would, it, what would its quality be? That's hard to quantify. Very hard to quantify. Um, the, the A value for the work of art in general is, is the, the intrinsic value of the work of art in a vacuum, plus what it adds to philosophy, plus what it adds to science, plus what it adds to the truth, uh, the, the, the truth people adhere to in the universe, and how, how much it adds to the intelligence of people in the universe, and how much it adds to the well-being of people in the universe. And of course, you just add these up. So actually, if you think about this in a mathematical way, uh, this is like, these are six three-dimensional vectors, and what you do is you always just add them, 
and when you add them, you take the, uh, you don't take the magnitude, but you just add the values of the vectors, and that's your x. And so, basically, when we make a decision, we're looking at three-dimensional space, and we try and pick, we try and pick the, the, the vectors, we try and uh, pick the vectors in our decision-making that give us the biggest sum at the end. The biggest, it's not absolute value, but it's the biggest, well, it would be vectors with the biggest absolute value that add to this anyway. Actually, no, it's not necessarily true. It's, it's vectors that have the biggest, uh, like, yeah, it, it's, it's vectors that when you add the components, you have the highest value. That's just all it is. Let's add it, let's think about another example, because I just want to go through one more. Oh, okay, one thing I forgot to mention, YouTube videos. I think I mentioned it a little. The, the, there is an artistic value to YouTube videos. There's, there's, I mean, again, YouTube videos in general all go up here. Uh, whether you or not you make a YouTube video, again, it, it has a moral value in every single sense up here. Everything has a moral value, but especially in the artistic sense. That's something I believe, in fact. And you have to ask yourself whether or not the, the moral value of a channel is positive or negative is a question. Does a YouTube channel deserve to exist? I think that's an important question. Does my YouTube channel deserve to exist? I'll actually do that one. I'll try to do that one without bias, obviously, but it might be hard. But, but ask yourselves that. Does my channel deserve to exist? If you've watched this far, does my channel deserve to exist? I can't really name too many channels that don't deserve to exist, but I can name some channels that I would say are about net zero for me. Stefan Molyneux's channel deserves to exist, I would say, because even though the, P, the, the PA is negative and the SA can sometimes be positive, I would say that the EA is very high for Steph Molyneux because his therapy thing that he does, he tries to actually help people with the therapy thing that he does, uh, and he tries to give them good advice, and he genuinely does care about them, you know, on his talk show. That's the, the sense that I get. So I would say EA is very high, and because EA is largely affected, um, and EM is high, and obviously EC might or might not be high, it depends, I would say EX is high, and so X is generally high. It's, it's, it's not positive. The philosophy stuff is negative for sure. Okay, I've stated my opinion on Molyneux a lot, but PA is definitely negative for me. Okay, his, his channel does not appeal to philosophy that well, not because it's wrong even. Uh, well, actually, no, no, PA could actually still be positive because even though it's not, because it, it, honestly, the fact that I say it's negative could just depend on the fact that I disagree with what he says. Um, essay is negative for him because he says stuff that is not a scientifically true or accurate. Uh, he says stuff like, I mean, there's the whole free will determinism thing, and my opinion about this is that determinism is literally, literally follows from science, and free will, uh, like, does not exist uh, if you take science into account. Molyneux believes in free will, as I found out, uh, thanks to the commenters on the last video, so essay is negative. Um, SC is obviously negative for the same reason. Uh, honestly, no, never mind, I'm not gonna talk, I'm not gonna say what I was about to say. I would say that PA is actually still positive now that I'm being unbiased, because even though he is not good at philosophy, I would say that the fact that he gets people to think about it is good. PC, the consequence of his philosophy, of his appeal to philosophy, is actually negative, because, because I think that, I, I, this is my opinion, but I think the consequence of his channel gets people to think about philosophy in the incorrect way. And a lot of it is that people probably accept uh, Molyneux's views because he acts smart. And uh, because of that, they're not thinking about philosophy in the proper way. They're not thinking about it in the humble, sort of uh, Socratic way that you're supposed to think about philosophy. So I would say there's a negative effect. There's a negative PC, probably a positive PA. The PM is positive because his motivations are to be a philosopher and to be well. So PM is positive, but like I said, PM is smaller than these two. Uh, the aesthetic. Well, okay, the aesthetic to his channel is actually pretty nice. His videos are long, and, uh, they're pretty well edited. Better than this shit, honestly, but, uh, so, so, Alpha A is decent. Also, what's factored into this is the fact that he uses a lot of metaphors and artistic language, and I would say that that has a purely aesthetic value in and of itself, so this is positive. This is technically positive as well. I don't know if he does it on purpose, but... This is uh, around zero, it's very small, but alpha x is definitely a bit uh, positive. And again, still smaller than the other values, but ex is what makes his channel a net positive for me, even though I disagree with a lot of what he says. Um, 
I can think of a lot of other channels. With most channels, the real defining feature is going to be the alpha, I would say, because the alpha is where the value comes from, the moral value comes from. Uh, with my channel specifically, I mean, I, I actually, the first video I, I ever made was I tried to sort of answer the question, does a channel, does my channel deserve to exist? Now, that doesn't make much sense if it's my first video, but I was sort of explaining what I was going to try to do in terms of my content, and my content is, you know, this stuff, right? Does this type of content deserve to exist? And I don't mean does it deserve to exist in a, uh, in a sort of uh, free speech rights kind of way. I mean, does it deserve to exist in a moral value sense? Does it deserve to exist in terms of this stuff? Does it deserve to exist because of this, this, and that? I would say it does. Um, now, obviously, E is very, very low for my channel. It's, it's around zero. Uh, I would say that the I is reasonably high, but again, there's an upper limit to how high the I could be. T is high, because by definition, I'm preaching the truth and, and intelligence values right here, so that has to be positive. Uh, truth has to be positive. I'm definitely appealing to the truth virtue. SM, uh, SX, PX, and Alpha X. So, S depends on my content, but in general I would say that, again, this is something very, very small because there's not too much scientific content. I'm not trying to teach science. If I was trying to teach you guys science, then the SA, the SM, and the SC would be high, but my motivation is, in the very least, to, to be scientifically honest, so, and to preach the virtue, of course, so these are still positive, but not too positive. The, the P, the, again, the philosophy, the PX is also positive for that same reason. Again, not too high. And the alpha, well, the alpha is aesthetic, right? So is there an aesthetic to my channel? I would say there is some aesthetic to the channel. The fact that my videos are largely unedited and uh, low budget in that sense is a problem and definitely takes away from alpha A. But I think the actual content of what, what is happening here makes this positive uh, overall. And... Uh, well, the consequence is just the consequence is that this channel continues to exist and continues to appeal to the aesthetic. The sort of the, the consequence uh, for, for aesthetic works is actually pretty obvious because it's just, you have to measure, you, it's just time multiplied by the fact that this, it's just time, the amount of time that the thing exists multiplied by this. That's the only foreseeable consequence to the existence of, an, uh, of a work of art, is that it continues to exist and add to, you know, aesthetic appeal. You know, that's the intrinsic value of it continuing to exist. So, like, this is the intrinsic value of a, pe of a work of art existing within, a time, within like, one second, within a, an infinitesimally small amount of time, and this is the, the value of that work of art existing for a, a, a multitude of time, right? So there's that. So, yeah, honestly, the question is, does my channel deserve to exist? And that's kind of what I wanted to end this note on. <sighs> Again, that, that, that would be my answer. And my question, the question is, of course, I'm not really appealing to E because I'm not trying to, like, help starving children in Africa. And I actually talked about that in my first video and, and why I, I'm not doing that, okay? Uh, the reality of it is not that simple. That takes resources that I don't have. It takes motivation that I don't have. So, I mean, obviously my motivation... I mean, it's not that I don't have the motivation. It's I don't have the motivation to do the work, right? So you have to factor that in. The other part of it is I'm actually not ready. I'm getting educated right now. I mean, I need resources to, to get resources. I need an education. And not only that, but I don't just want to get resources by doing whatever. I want to get resources by doing something I enjoy. So, you know, the, the, the most morally valuable, optimal way of doing things would be to do something I enjoy to attain resources and then use those resources to help starving children in Africa. Uh, because meanwhile, doing the stuff I enjoy you know, doing th stuff you enjoy and are passionate about is the most morally optimal thing because if you do that stuff, you are going to be good at that stuff. If you're passionate about it, you care about it, and are willing to get good at that, uh, at so at that, at that stuff, at that X. You know, so in the long run, in the, you know, if you take consequences into account, in the long run, I would say doing something you enjoy is the most morally optimal path to take. So that's my argument for why I'm not helping starving children in Africa, not, again. And the, the whole point of the empathy thing is that I continue to act in a way that I'm aware that there are starving children in Africa and that I am willing to help them if the opportunity arises, but the path I should take it depends on what I am most capable of 
most best at, basically, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, in terms of passion, in terms of intelligence, in terms of um, my capabilities, my resources, in terms of my, my willingness to do it, all, and all that stuff. Because there's definitely people on this planet that are, that are uh, more better equipped to deal with something like that than I am. So that's my justification. But seriously, uh, ask yourselves the question, does my channel deserve to exist? And I want, honestly, and uh, I want you guys to answer it in this sense and try and apply the formula. You know, uh, calculate all of these and add them up. If that's too much work, then don't, whatever. But, yeah, I think, uh, the reason I do this stuff is I think it's just cool. I think it's interesting and obviously important, uh, given that this is, like I said, the, the moral system that I want within the ideal society, ideal human society that we should have, right? Yeah, so that's basically it. One thing I didn't talk about, passion. Passion, actually, that, that passion is another tertiary virtue that I should put down here. Uh, let's use rho as a symbol for it. Rho M, rho A, rho C, and rho X. <clears throat> yeah, passion. And this is general idea of passion. Passion about anything. Why did I actually think about this? Are you motivated by passion? That's a very important question. If you are, then this is positive. If you're not motivated by passion, then it's negative. Or if you lack passion as a human being. Uh, passion in A. Are you doing something that you're passionate about or not? The consequence of, of your passion is, are you, consequentially, are you doing things out of passion in the future or not? And rho x is the total. So, yeah, that, that, that would be the thing with passion. Passion is incredibly important, and how passionate you are probably affects how uh, alpha you are, how what the value of alpha is down here. So there's that to consider. Excuse me. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Now, if there's any other virtues that should be added to this list, that, that you think should be added to this list, then by all means let me know. Uh, yeah, this is, this is actually quite a bit of work that I did to, to, to name all these and, and point them out. Th I just want to point out, this, this formula here pretty much tells you everything you need to know about me. You know, I, I, I try to apply this formula all the time whenever I do stuff, whenever I make a judgment. You know, if I say reality TV is bad, it's bad because it doesn't have very much moral value, because its X is, is very low. In fact, its X is negative once you take all of this stuff into account. With reality TV, because of because of what it is, alpha x is negative for reality TV. I'm just going to say that outright. Uh, Sx and px also negative if you take that into account. Rho x definitely negative, please. And um, there's some intelligence to it, but not much, so that's negative. Tx, tx again. This factors. This is the intelligence. This has to do with the the the. the the, the intelligence here is the intelligence of required to create the thing and the intelligence in the long run. The intelligence and the consequences, right? The intelligence of does this help the human race in the long run. That's what you have to think about when calculating IX. And uh, TX is, it's not honest because it's fake, because it's reality TV, so this is negative. And EX is definite. Well, okay. <laughs> See, th this is complicated. EX is complicated for reality TV, right? Because obviously... Okay, EM, definitely negative, because people who create reality TV are not motivated to help people at all. That said, it's not obvious, to actually, because you have to weigh their motivation to create something people will enjoy and their motivation to make, to, to simply, well, their motivation is just to make money, so I would just say this is negative throughout. But in EA, when you calculate EA, you have to weigh the fact that some people will enjoy this reality TV and get fun out of it, and there's a positive well-being value to that, and the fact that uh, they are spending the time to watch reality TV rather than something better, so you have to weigh those two intrinsically for EA, and the consequences, you have to weigh the fact that you have to weigh the fact that reality TV continues to exist and people will waste their time watching it. And, and you have to weigh the fact, the enjoyment they get from watching it versus, uh, you have to, versus the cost of watching it. And the cost of watching it is high because it pollutes your brain and literally adds nothing. It's, it has no artistic value. So it pollutes your brain and does not really add to your well-being because you're not working and you're not doing anything productive while you uh, watch reality TV, right? So this is negative. 
This is negative for sure. And because alpha x and is going to be so damn negative for reality TV, the whole thing is just going to be negative like that. So yeah, just try to apply the formula, I'm saying. Um, now, I want to say, I apply the formula. I'm not perfectly objective when I do it, because to apply the formula objective, you actually have to like think about every variable at once, which isn't easy. The reason I... I'd say I'm decent at it is because I honestly don't have to think about the secondary, the, the, the first three virtues at all. I don't have to think about them because in making decisions, I already have the motivation to do, to have empathy just in my like behavior basically. And I'm not unintelligent. I mean, well, I'm not going to be arrogant here, but I wouldn't say that I'm unintelligent by my own standards. Right? So that's not wrong. The only problem with this is that I don't always know whether I'm hurting someone or not. Uh, just by virtue of the fact that I'm not very good at figuring out what another person's feelings are at a given point in time. Society is partly at fault for that. I am partly at fault for that. So this isn't uh, exact. And this stuff down here, this is the only stuff that I really question whenever I do anything. Is I question whether it appeals to science, philosophy, aesthetics, and my passions. This appeals to my passions, so it's pretty obvious. It, uh, it sort of, it definitely appeals to philosophy, it sort of appeals to science, and it definitely appeals to art, so that's why I do it, right? It's, it's, it's really simple like that. Oh, you could also put stuff down, other stuff down here, like sex, for instance, uh, relationships, just because, you know, stuff like that. Anything, go like the tertiary uh, virtues are honestly all the, again, like I said, they're all the virtues that aren't the first three. So, take them for what you will. And I keep, I kept talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you would have to, I would actually have to say that everything in the tertiary virtues is basically the stuff at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's, it's, it's the very top of the pyramid plus the, uh, probably category four and three. Um, I and T definitely take into account, are definitely there to appeal to the first two categories, the bottom layer of Maslow's hierarchy of needs because, and so is the E value. The difference is, is that E, empathy, it, because I take into account human well-being and intimacy and because of how I defined empathy back at the start of this video is it's it's a measure of how intimate you are with other people right when you do something and and how much you care about them uh, because of that it actually includes the third layer of Maslow's hierarchy not just the first two this isn't just providing everybody with uh, a life and ensuring that the human race is, is, is in a state of well-being. It's also ensuring that the human race is in a state of intimacy, which is uh, a much stronger position than just ordinary well-being. Right, like that. So the, the point is, if you apply this formula, just parting thoughts now, is you, you, you become, uh, you, let's say you, you might become a bit of an elitist, because if you actually think about it, I mean, a lot of this is subjective, but if you actually think about if you think about art, and uh, like E, I, and T are obvious, but the fact is that so few people accept E as a primary virtue that you become an elitist by default if you expect people to be empathetic. And you would have to condemn uh, behavior that has low values of EX, therefore you would become an elitist based on that. You would also become an elitist down here, because down here you have to think about uh, actions appealing to art, and honestly, a lot of people disagree on what counts as good art for some media, but for a lot of, but I think in general, most people would agree on when something really adds to art and when something really takes away from art. I mean, I talk about my like theories on artistic quality in general, like in another video or whatever, and I actually wanted to talk a lot about games and stuff when I started the channel, and I still do. So there's going to be, uh, there's going to be artistic value there. But the point is, if you actually want to think about artistic value, you, uh, you, you will find that a lot of games and a lot of art in general, a lot of music, a lot of film does not add to art and it does not add to, it does not add to aesthetics that well. It doesn't. If you really apply the formula, you'll notice that it does not because you can't just, again, you, you, you will agree about this. Yeah, I, I imagine most people will agree on this because this this value alpha it is not a measure of how much people enjoyed the art right keep that in mind it's not about people enjoying something okay a game you know games I mean game they're meant to be it's meant to be enjoyed but the actual value the artistic value is an intrinsic 
uh, arbitrary quantity. It is not a measure of how much people enjoyed a film. So if a movie is extremely popular like Transformers, does not mean that it has a high value of X, because like I mentioned, art does not affect E that much. So even though a lot of people enjoy it, and it does add to empathy because of that, EX is still going to be small because in general, this, because of scaling, art does not affect E in a, to a large extent. Not immediately. In fact, the place where art will affect E to a large extent is probably in the consequence section over here, or in the unforeseeable consequence uh, section. I imagine, you know, the, the, the art that has survived millennia and years, that is the art that we remember, that is the art that has actually affected society. But that's all unforeseeable, you know, you could not have foreseen that when that art was created, right? So, yeah, to actually, the, 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 this formula pretty much forces people to not be biased when they, uh, it forces people to not be biased when they look at something like art. Because I said that this is intrinsic, right? Like, you can't just look at a movie and say, oh, well, this movie was popular, therefore it's good, right? Because, uh, because I'll say, oh, this movie is bad. You know, I'll, I'll go to that and I'll say that to people, but, but somebody will, will tell me immediately, well, well, I enjoy it. A lot of people enjoy it. And see, that's not an argument. See, oh, that's not an argument, but that, 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 that's not alpha down here. Okay, you have to come up with some other reason why alpha is high for art. And again, because of how art is just aesthetic art as a category, alpha X is the deciding factor for how good it is. Not E, not I, not T, not anything up here except for alpha. Alpha decides how good a movie is and how good a game is and how, and how good literally means the moral value. And by the way, when I talk about artistic quality, and when I talk about the quality of art, I'm referring to... I'm actually referring to Alpha A more than anything. I'm referring to Alpha A. Alpha C is a measure of how... Uh, what, what the to what uh, artistic quality... how it affects the field, how that this piece of art affects other art in the future. Uh, right, that's what this is a measure of. It, it, this is basically a measure of what art is inspired by a given piece of art. That's not something that is usually considered. That's not something I consider, and this is just the motivation of the artist to create good art, right? Uh, or the motivation of the work of art in general. So this Alpha X is obviously, it's the total artistic value of a work of art, but I just, the, the, the total artistic value is not something we usually talk about. We talk about Alpha A when talking about art. Um, and Alpha A, by the way, Alpha A can actually depend on SA and... Well, it, it depends on some scientific and philosophical content of the art. But that's, that's more, uh, that's more complicated. I don't want to actually get into how Alpha A, I, how I calculate Alpha A. Uh, but, because this, honestly, this is probably the most subjective of all the things on the list, is Alpha A right here. Because this is pretty obvious. This stuff, like, consequences is just a measure of consequences, right? We can all agree on what that is. Motivation is a measure of how motivated you are. We can agree on what that is. Essay and PA? Well, the essay is a measure of how something appeals to science for science's sake. And that's pretty obvious because science basically just uh, adheres to the rules of inductive logic. If you studied, like, philosophy of science or anything, it just appeals to the rules of uh, inductive logic. So a measure of how good something is scientifically is just a measure of how much it adds to science. So that's pretty obvious. And PA is... PA is less obvious, but it's still just a measure of how much something adds to philosophy. Um, also more obvious and less subjective. You know, I think most philosophers probably agree as to how much, like, a theory of philosophy adds to the discipline as a whole. Um, alpha A, however, is very, very subjective. But I would say that for works of art, where pe there's a lot of, there's going to be work of art that a lot of people think is good and a lot of people think is bad. For works of art like that, this, this, this whole model basically uh, forces it to be that if two, if two groups disagree wildly about Alpha A, then one of them has to be wrong. That's what I'm saying. One of them has to be wrong. If two people, some, a lot of people like a game and a lot of people hate it, then uh, one of the groups has to be wrong. Now, I'm not actually against people, you know, picking favorite games or, 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 or anything like that. You know, if you have one favorite game and I have another favorite game, that's fine. That, that doesn't matter. But, you know, you can't... The, 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 in terms of moral value, a situation where I love a game and you hate it simply cannot happen. That, that is wrong. And not because of this, but because of that. Okay, one of us has to be wrong about that, about our perceived value of alpha A uh, for this formula to work. Otherwise, we can't actually agree on what alpha X is. But what I've noticed actually among people is that, at least my friends, is that we often agree on when a game is good, 
But we don't agree on when a game is great. We don't necessarily agree on what our favorite game is. But we'll agree when a game is good and when a game is bad. So that's what I'm just trying to say. If, if there's wild, if, if there's a, a work that people wildly disagree about, then that is unacceptable with, with this model. You know, you have to, uh, you have to assume that people always, you have to come to a consensus of some kind before making moral decisions. Anyway, th th that's basically all I wanted to mention. You know, take that for what you will, and please, please apply the formula to my channel. I want to hear honest opinions about this, and, uh, what, what, uh, what values here are negative. Because I can think of some obvious ones, like, um, uh, some obvious negatives here in that, in the type of content I do. But, anyway, just let me know. And as always, cheers, and thanks for watching, if you got this far.